We have Chaim Meisel's, the Satmar Rebbe's grandson as well. Great grandson. Personally, the Shiva lifestyle wasn't working for me that well. We have similarities already. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree on the idea that a lot of Satmar guys are rebellious. I don't think they're as close-minded as people think. I think some of them are very bright. Seeing the outside world, and it's actually good. And I kind of like being from. It sounds like you don't agree with the way necessarily BB even went about the war. I think if you're the head of the idea, and this is what happened now, you should not be in politics. Every day I'm thanking God that it's not my responsibility. So what happened October 7th? Where were you? Hundreds of messages. Where are you? We're on war. You gotta come right now. Doesn't matter what they do, Israel is here to stay. I walked into houses in Gaza that I wish my house would have looked like that. What would you say about a video that comes out or TikTok videos that come out of those insane measures? I think any teenager can make a video and say whatever he wants. And if right. we believe it, we're the problem. I had soldiers who came from really, really broken homes. I didn't think that no people ever had a life like that. I'm sure people have wronged you. People apologize. No one is there for you. You got to be there for yourself. And if you're not going to fight for yourself, no one is going to help you. Alright everybody, welcome to another episode of Mislabeled. Uh, if you're watching this and you could please like, subscribe, and comment, that would make, uh, I should say, mean the world to us as we are working very, very hard to deliver content. Okay, so obviously there's a lot going on. We're looking for the new co-host. There's a lot happening. So I have some good friends that are actually really kind and helping me out as I roll. I have here a good friend of mine from the UK, Josh. Thank you so much for Thank you being for around. Me. Thank very you for, for being here. Um, Super appreciated, actually. So we're gonna be doing a bunch of this, like as we go, different people, until I settle on specifically uh, the right person, because we're not gonna go through another co-host again. So I'm, I'm just being very, very like diligent and pretty obsessive about who I bring on. So expect a variety of different friends of mine throughout the years to be rolling on. Now we have a very, very special guest with us. Um, Thank you. We have Chaim Meisels, uh, IDF Lieutenant. Captain by now. Captain by now. I, I'm going to ask you actually to explain all the rankings. We're going to get to that because I'm not a, a an army guy, so I don't know all of them. And there's like a, feels like a good solid 10 of them. So I, I'm not. Way less, more than 10. Way more than 10. <laughs> uh, there you go. That's how much I okay, know about yeah. the army stuff. Um, so we have Chaim Meisels also. Uh, the Satmar Rebbe's grandson as well. Great grandson. The Samar of his great grandson as well. Yeah, and the former one. Not the one from today, the former one. The former one. That's something that I I, I think we're going to explain Go to the audience as well. No problem. Okay. So we have okay. Chaim Aziz with us. He actually just got back from serving in Gaza. You were there for, what, 100 days? So first time around 90-something, high 90 days. And then I was again back there after being home for a little bit for another 21 days. So, so you, during the, this war, you went during there for war, 90 days and then went back? Right. So during this war, I was there for 90 days. They released my unit. We all came, like everyone went back home. I came to America. Some guys, most guys actually stayed in Israel. And then after being a month, month and a couple of days home, they said, hey, we need you guys back. So I went back for another 21 days and then we got out again. Okay. Trust me, everyone watching this, we're going to get into the, the, the war. Like we're, we're not going to leave that, but in the beginning, I just want to get a little background there. Okay. So could you give me background, just childhood, where you grew up, first of all, um, yeah, just a little context. Yeah, okay, so I grew up in Williamsburg to a okay. Satmar family, obviously. Um, and then as life continued, that lifestyle didn't work out the best for me for a bunch of different reasons. And when I was about 19, I moved to Israel, joined the IDF. I was in there for about five and a half years, close to six. Then I got out, moved back coincidentally to the United States, I didn't plan on. I got out a couple weeks before COVID-19 started. So just life happened to be that I ended up here and I stayed, um, met my wife, got married. And as I thought life is gonna be very simple and straight and everything is gonna be easy. October 7 happened, went back to Israel on October 7, went into Gaza, did that whole thing. And now hopefully I'm here back for a while. So a couple of quick questions. First of all, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 30. Just 30. Became. Got it. Um, and are you comfortable sharing a little bit about why that, you know, growing up there didn't work out so perfectly for you? To, you know, obviously, left, like you said, you left as well when you were 19. I believe everyone has things that work better for them. And me personally, the Shiva lifestyle wasn't working for me that well for bunch of different reasons. We have similarities already. 
<laughs> okay, very, very possible. <laughs> Do we have similarities? Oh, yeah. He yeah. Also has similarities. And I just felt this is the right thing for me at the time. And I believe it was. So I did that. I liked it. So I extended my time. So I started. When I joined, I thought I'm going to do 18 months inside. I'll get out. And my plan back then was to go to medical school. Um, that didn't happen. As I got in, a couple months later, I got in to Special Forces, which made me sign a three-year contract, optional for four. As I almost finished my training in the Special Forces group that I was in, it's about a year and two months of training, I decided that I want to become an officer, like a lieutenant. So what are the, yeah, what are the, can you okay. just run that through that quickly? So you have a regular soldier, then you have a sergeant or a commander. It's on the same ranking level, but a little bit of a different job. And then after that, you could become an officer. Becoming an officer means you go to a school for another nine months. It's one month of like a pre-program and then four months of in the classroom and then four months in the field that you train to become an officer. Once you become an officer, you get your job as an officer. So my first job as an officer was a regular lieutenant. I did that for all my service, um, active different jobs that I got as a lieutenant. Once I got out, actually in the middle of the war now, I became a captain, which is a little got bit of higher ranking. Got it. So after the most basic level is the officer slash lieutenant? After the most or basic level is the commander. Is commander. A commander, right commander sergeant slash sergeant. So you can go commander out, which is you're in charge of a group of about 10 guys. It's a four-month program that okay. you got to pass. About of 10 guys, and then you become a commander. Then you can go the sergeant route, which means you become involved in your team also as commanding the guys under you but you have to work side by side with an officer you're in charge a little bit more about the logistics and make sure they have the food and you're like the right hand man for the lieutenant but you're also above the commanders and then from there you can go more logistic route kind of a way as a like whatever sergeant right and then you can go officer route which is Got it. More than planning. Got it. Um, I, I, I want to. I just want to get back in. I, I do want to get to this. Just uh, one of the things specifically. So, growing up in Saudi right, specifically. So, you, nineteen was when you went to Israel. Yeah. You were married. I was married for a couple of months. Didn't really work out for me. Um, with all respect to my ex, just didn't work for her either, and it just didn't fit. Got it. So. This is something that's actually really like piquing my curiosity because I come from a more like Haredi Haimish background. Mm -hmm. Like Satma family, how did they react to that? Like to you to, going to, to the IDF? Yeah, that's pretty huge. Well, they were not as happy as you can imagine, but on the other side, they were very, very understanding. Which means although they didn't understand why I'm doing and what, or what I'm doing, they did understand the way that that's what I'm doing and that's what might work for me. So they had some hardships in the beginning, but eventually they, That's really they were supporting surprising. me as a human being, not as not as what my job is, but as a son, as a brother. So a two different question, here. was that just your family or the community as a whole, would you say? I think uh, most people who knew me. Most people, most people knew me understood that. It's not like I didn't go, I, I, I'm not rebellious, which means right. I didn't go in any way. I'm not against anyone, like in any particular Haimshi community, I have nothing against them. It just, I respect them and I do respect the way they live their life. And I live my life very similar in a way. Just that particular lifestyle didn't work for me. I was more like, I would say, a working boy in a way. Right. And the army was the right thing at the time for me to do. Right. Were you always like this, even as a little, even as a younger kid, let's say? Or was this like 18 and you just like, you had a radical life shift, let's just say, and you were pretty much within the... No, in my, in, I always thought about it. Since I'm a small kid, I, I yeah. definitely didn't think about it. I didn't think it's going to actually happen. It wasn't part of my plans. But when I got the opportunity, it happened. Also, another thing is, in a very similar way than now, I joined right before... Like, I started my joining process right before Tsuketan, which was the war in 2014. And I got in in the middle of the war, which means the whole... In a very similar way than now, people were very pro and understanding that Israel needs... 
soldiers yeah. and and so it's more there to going help. on it was a little bit more after this yeah but i'm curious did you feel the same way like as you do now in regards to the community like when you were going to the army like when you were initially you left the community you're going to israel did you feel the same way of like like understanding both sides i'm not sure if i phrased in that a way, so right, well, in, in, but... i'll, I'll if I understand your question, if you mean that people support my decision? Right, because you, know, you were saying that, like, the community right. on the so street. Right, so in a way, like... not everyone did support it, but I knew in my heart that even though they don't say it, they probably support a little bit, or they didn't understand it at the time, and I knew eventually they will understand. So, for example, one guy, one rabbi, actually, I'm not going to name him, said, hey, you're going in, you're going to regret it after a couple of days, and we're going to have to rescue you out and pay a lot of money to get you out. And I said... That's very possible, although I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> wow. Um, so in a way, they just didn't understand to it. It's like, I don't know how to explain it to you, but like, let's say if you do something very different than your family, right? I don't know what your family does, but let's I have say... somewhat, yeah. Let's say your family is very into the medical field, right? Your father, your mother, everyone is like doctors, right? And you become and say, hey, I'm going to go into, I don't know, I'm going to open a plumbing company. Maybe... A, in the beginning, it's not going to be as good, but eventually, let's say, make a big business but out of it. Once you're making the money, they then... will understand it. So, in a way, not that I made any money out of it, but right. no, but I so understand I, the point you're making. So, uh, my only question would be: obviously, it goes without saying that Satmar is very, you know, outwardly, obviously, anti-the Zionist movement, right? And I don't say that. I'm not here to cash judgment. It's not what my question is. My question is just simply: there's an ideology that I'm sure was given over as you were growing up, and you're in this space of right. the anti-Zionist movement. Did you not get indoctrinated with that a little bit? Like any single type of ideology that's really pushed upon someone as a child? Well, I, sorry, I, I did understand what they're saying. However, I disagree because Satmar's problem with Zionism, as far as I understand, was the creation of the state of Israel, which means they're against Israel becoming a state. However, it's very different. Now we have a state. We have a country. We have a few million pe people who live in Israel and they need your security. It's like... Some guy would say, you shouldn't live in America, right? A bunch of rabbis said before World War II, don't go to America. However, now, once we live here, we are voting in the system. We right. are we have our own Shamram and Atzala. Do and they we made see it all... that way? Do they see it that way? Not everyone sees Not it that anymore. way yet, but I believe one day people will understand it. It's, Got it. it. I think even now, by the way, it has softened a little bit. Like, that some, like that I remember... I, I saw oh, something recently about the Satmar Rebbe doing something during the war. This Is that, am I mistaken? I, I saw, I don't know if it's true or not. Or I saw I saw that Satmar Rebbe did send money yes. for food to soldiers. I don't know if it's true or not. I didn't get the food. I feel like you would be <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. I thought you'd be the best it's, it's, insult for this of all time. It, it's very possible. Although I would say is, um, some Satmar guys definitely did help with money. Really? Um, for certain guys. Really? For sure. That's very special. For sure, yeah. Although yeah. a lot more could be done. Right. But a lot of guys did help in a very quiet way. Um, helped. So and I, I think if yeah. Satmar Rebbe would have still lived by now, he would have done the same thing. Which means when you have, for example, okay, one of my friends passed away in the war. Um, right next to me, oh, he goodness. left a wife and four kids behind. Just now. Two months ago. But I'm not sure in, next in, oh, in, in, Yeah. I, I, I put him in the whatever i uh, put him away um i believe 100 percent that satma Rebbe would have sent money to his wife and kids for sure right like i have no doubt in that although they might disagree why you went there but i'm sure like a yid a yid. yeah like. it, it doesn't matter i really believe so got it what are your obviously i i love talking to you you walked into the house i never met you obviously and, and you have this like calm, middle ground demeanor. Just like, it would almost seems a reasonable, just like almost middle of the road demeanor, which is very impressive given your history. And, you know, obviously you grew up a certain way. There's been a lot, I'm sure, given a lot of pushback and a lot of, I assume a little bit of a difficult journey. And yet you've walked in and you're a very even keeled, calm, like you said, not rebellious person, right? What are your thoughts given not just regarding Satmer, but in general, the more Hasidish, you know, Hasidic communities in general that are obviously more of a rigid, you know, style of life, some of them, right? And you yet have left. You disagree with some of that or 
Like, how have you found... I, I, I disagree on the idea that a lot of Satmar guys are rebellious. I think for someone who's not in the community, the people who he sees, who he's... Like, let's say, if I don't live in the community of Satmar, right? When I see a Satmar guy, it's probably going to be the rebellious one or the one who's making the news. Although... There is a hundred thousand probably Satmar people who you never heard about. Right. The ones you hear about is about maybe a hundred who make noise. So I no, think for sure. most Satmar guys are not. I'm just asking your opinion on like the, 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 the I don't want to call it closed mindedness, but they're very insular, right? That aspect, right? You didn't get an English education, I assume. Right. Right. So that stuff specifically. Just, I, I tell you, I don't think they're as closed minded as people Got outside it. think. I think some of them are very bright. That's very successful sure. in business yeah, very and in learning. In business, it's just what some people outside could think they're closed-minded, but really they're not. I'm it's, just, it's just, let's say, if I tell my kid now, right? I don't have a kid that I'm raising at the moment, but hopefully soon I will have. If I tell my kid to do something a way that I believe in, doesn't mean that I'm dumb or I don't want my kid to be on TikTok the whole day. It's just I would want you to choose not to be. It's not like, whatever. So they see the outside world. They understand what we do. And they still choose to live their life without WhatsApp, without the internet, because in a way, it makes their life a lot easier. Like, imagine not knowing the news every day. No, I, I'm way not better. hating yeah, on that community. Sure. <laughs> I think it's fantastic for a lot, a lot of people. Like, I would say the, like, stereotype, let's say, of summer doesn't come from nowhere, right? Like, there are occasional people who do, like, I can, from me and my brother, right? They tried kicking us out of a shawl because he's wearing a kippah sugar. Like, you do have some of these crazies, but I find it very refreshing that you're so middle of the ground. That, like, you're so, like, get to know these people, you'll see what wonderful people they are. Because that's been my experience right. in the but Heimish community. Let's, let's go back to your shul thing, okay? Mm -hmm. How many guys of the shul were actually trying to kick you out? One. One. Out of how many? 150. Which means that no less than a 1%. But you're right. right. I do hear what you're saying. It's, those, it's always the loudest ones that it's, make it's the most the, noise. It's the ones who make, like, if I'm going to go like out politics. now, I'm going to say every kid in college does drugs. Is that true? No. No. The ones who do drugs, we know about. It's, you're saying it's they're the, the very same visible way, ones. Like, like, one good thing that I've seen, and based on my, that I went to the IDF and I was a lieutenant and now a captain for, for a while... What you do get is you do get to get into families and you're in charge of a bunch of so like a lot of soldiers. So you see their daily life and their family life. You get an insert kind of in a different way that you get. And there is problems everywhere. It's just people like to like strike that specifically. But if you really live both lives, you see that there's trouble. You see the everywhere. humanity in everything. Uh, it's the way I look at it, at least. I hear that. It's very nice. I really hear that. All right, everybody, just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor for this episode, CubX. CubX is an IT company that personally does my own IT. I've recommended these guys to multiple of my friends. They have come back with nothing but rave reviews. Uh, these guys have fantastic, fantastic customer service. There are no hold times. You call, you get through, they fix your problem immediately and they are truly a group of talented IT professionals. They service specifically companies of five employees or more. They have a special division for companies with 500 employees or more and a additional division specifically dedicated to the healthcare field, which is an area that they particularly specialize in. If you'd like to get through to them, you can reach them at 732 444 8771 press 2 to get through to the sales department you can also email them at hello at cubx.com that's hello at cubx.com you can also check them up online at cubx.com again that's cubx.com uh, if you're a new company that's starting out and need a great it team definitely reach out to these guys or if you're an existing company that is currently not happy with your existing it firm i would highly highly recommend this group Thank you so much, guys. Back to the episode. So you obviously, so you went, like you said, you went to Israel when you were 19. Do you have a, uh, like a specific nuanced view of Israel or are you just like, like myself and let's just say the classic Litvish person at this point that's just pro-Israel and like, like the state of Israel or do you have more nuanced view at all? So I'm like a middle ground, let's just say, of how you grew up with Samer and like, a, you know, a middle ground between, let's just say, the standard Litvish world and let's say the Samer world. Or are you fully, let's just say, on the Litvish side? I, I, I don't think I'm on the Litvish side and I don't think I'm on the Satmar side. I'm somewhere in between, I would say, Datilomi to Satmar in a way. Which so means yeah. I, 
the whole way Israel was created is a little problematic, I would say. In, what in terms regard? of politics, of Herzl, the, the reason why he did it might be a little problematic. Like the, the, the secularization the element? In a way, yeah. However, it's a fact. So it, let's say if your kid does something that you might disagree a little bit, it's still your kid, right? And you got to do everything to support him, to help him, to love him, and to protect him. So even though I might disagree a little bit on the way it was created, I still think it's my kid and it's my country and it's my people and it's my Jewish brothers and sisters. Like, I'm Israel, come and, fast. And I got to do everything to protect them and whatever I can. And I did and I will do. It's just the way. I'm with you. Could you take me into training for the army? I was always so, so curious about this. Um, the, the standard soldier. But first of all, just out of curiosity, these reserves that are being called up. Right. These people haven't been trained in, in 14 years, right? So what's happening? They're just taking a guy that has been in shul for 20 years learning and just throwing him into like the middle army, like in middle Gaza? Like what, what exactly is the... Okay. So I'll give you... Uh, there's a lot of ways to answer this question, but the military, right? Let's say there is... Let's make a group, okay? Let's make a group of 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. In order to have a military of a few fighters, you need about 10,000 people to have about a thousand combat fighters. And I'll explain it. So you need logistics, kitchens, communications. Um, there's clothing. Everything. There's so many different things. So in order for you to have a thousand successful fighters, you need about 900 guys, like 9,000 9, guys to, one to support them. So there's a lot of things that you could do in order to help those guys. So I'll give you an example. I was in Khan Yunus three weeks ago, right? I walk in, in middle of Khan Yunus, like, I have a video, I'll send it to you if you want. In middle of Khan Yunus, I walk in, I see a guy, a soifer, sitting and writing a Megillah. Now, obviously I bought it off, but <laughs> the, the reason why he can do that is because his job, for example, is communication. So he has to make sure that all the communications are connected, they work well. So he has about 10 hours of a day that he doesn't, He's not busy, right? Uh, Although my guys and myself, I didn't have 10 minutes empty that I could just sit and write. Right. So he, and he doesn't need as much training as a combat soldier needs, right? He needs to know how to put in one, eye, one wire to the other one, connect them, make sure they work, and then be on top of them. And that's a crucial job. It's a very, very important job. But you can still have any yeshiva guy do that. It, it, when you're in a place like Khan Yunus, is every single block as dangerous as the next block? Or is it like, okay, this area of Khan Yunus is basically safe. You don't really have to worry. You can kind of just like chill with it. And like, I'm just trying to understand what it means to be on a battlefield. Right. So one, you never know, which means we had, I'll, I'll, I can go down storyline. Like uh, I think the best way is like live examples on, on what happened Please. inside. Um, so first of all, there's, you have to understand that when we're in Khan Yunus for 21 days an hour, uh, uh, in my, like what I did, you can't be 24 hours for 21 days on top of your game. You need to sleep, you need yeah. to eat, you need to relax, you need to make, you know, and you need some, like people need some mental kind of yeah, to relax. Like, I, I, I wonder there, about there's, all this. There's, there's no way. So we do rounds with our guys. So we do, some guys are more on guard duty and some guys are more like going on the missions and we kind of switch it around so people have some breathing time. So you can see some guys just sitting in Khan Yunus and playing blackjack. It's in Khan Yunus, in a house, but they have, like, laughing time. Um, I'll give you a story that happened to my team. I wasn't there, but was one of the, like, one of the guys in my platoon. They, we were in Khan Yunus for a while. By that, that time, it was, like, two days before we got out for the last time. We saw some civilians. A couple civilians walking by, a couple, few ladies, a few guys. We don't have permission to shoot at them. Although they're in a neighborhood that they're not allowed to be in, there is warnings and there's a very, very big possibility they are terrorists. Like, there's no reason they shouldn't be. And the terrorists we have seen did never go with like a green band or AK, you know, they just look like regular people. So we have really? reason to believe they are, but we still don't have... They look like regular civilians. Regular guys. I've seen them with regular guys shooting at us. That's so scary because like one mistake and like, I'm it's, guessing it's prison a, or something. It's a... Probably, yeah, it could happen. So those guys, we saw them, right? We did not get permission to open fire, which we can or understand or not understand. It, it's 
depending how you look at it. Uh, a day later, a team walked by there. One of my good friends, his name was Michael Gal, with the team, they walked by and then something exploded and he passed away on the spot. And that's a location where we passed a couple times before. If those guys did it or not, I don't know, because we haven't seen them putting any IEDs over there or, or, or something. And that makes it very dangerous in a way, because you don't never know when something might happen. Do you believe that they put it there? I don't know. Um, we left two days later, so they were in the middle of the investigation. And since I'm here now, they're obviously not going to tell me the results. Go if I'll go back to Israel, I'll be able to see if they put it there or something How else. big is the... Know. To be able to open fire or even drop a bomb from, from, from the air, right? An airstrike. How many levels of command are there to be able to get the go-ahead for, for uh, let's just say, an airstrike? For right. Example? So it all depends on the, on the reasoning for and the location you're at. So if it's in media danger, let's say if they're shooting at us from a building and I see them firing at me, I can have an airstrike there within a couple of minutes. I'm not, right. I'm not referring, yeah. Literally a couple of minutes. If it's a building that I believe it's a threat and I can't, I don't have anyone firing at the time. I need to know he has to, has to go up, get permission, usually within a couple of hours. Uh, how many chains of commands? Is it just like multiple? Are you speaking to the person who, are you speaking to the person who gives the final go ahead? So it really depends on the situation. So sometimes they would bring on the fighter, there's like fighter helicopters, like Apaches. Sometimes mm -hmm. they would bring them down to our radio channel and we spoke, we speak to them directly and but just give the, like, you know, just straight between us to them. If it's like, f like rescue fire in a way, if it's more complicated than that, then it goes up the chains of command. But if it's like an immediate threat, it will happen right away. And does right. a regular soldier have that same ability as you? Or is it because you're a commander? No, it's because I'm a commander. Ah, okay, so and the also, regular soldier comes to And also to you. I have to ask the guy above me to get the helicopter down to my channel, which means I, I don't have any way of saying, hey, I need a like I need him right now on my channel. I'll say, hey, I think I need something, and then they'll bring him down to my channel. So obviously, it, it does go through a whole. Like there like, are layers. Inter, there. there are layers, but there's sometimes that it goes within a couple of minutes, and sometimes within a couple of hours. If really depending how important that is. But we are very careful, and we really try not to kill anyone who doesn't have to be killed. So I was gonna say right. So I mean, from your perspective, just out of curiosity, just because it's the number one, like obviously, like claim genocide, genocide. I mean, utter stupidity. I don't think any genocide is happening, and there is days that we wish it would have been a lot easier. For example, when my friend Michael Gal, like Michael Gal, died, um, I believe we should have killed those guys the day before, and we didn't. But I can't tell you for sure what the reasoning was. Do you think the army should let you? Like to loosen like regulation if you're in such a like a guerrilla warfare where it's I, urban. I yeah, 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 yeah. I think it depends on the situation. Again, there has to be you have to think about it. like in the end Just to clarify There's a lot of people there and you don't want to kill everyone. So you were there at the end of the day for over a hundred days. Yeah. Right. Um you have inside information, so to speak. You're there on the ground and and you're effectively saying that the the precautions that go into make, trying to make sure civilians don't get killed are extreme? I, I think it's it's extreme. The, like, and I've, I've read some books about how the American army works or how other countries work. I think we are taking insane measures. So what would you say about, I don't know, there are, let's just say a video that comes out or TikTok videos that come out of what seems to not take you know, those insane measures. Just that it, I think any teenager can make a video and say whatever he wants. And if right. we believe it, we're the problem because I'm telling you, I was there and yeah. I wish it would have been easier. I totally hear that. It's like if you frame someone like slapping someone else and they slap you back, yeah. you only it, film it, the it, slapping it, back. It, 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 it's more than that even because like, I think some soldiers got killed because we didn't do enough. Really? Yeah. Um, and that's very sad. On like, you know, there's families and, and it's a very sad situation. But... So what happened October 7th? Where were you? So October 7th, I was, so my wife is from New Square. Okay. So I went to my in-laws for the second days i did not think any war is gonna break out who did yeah I, I, all the rosh Hashanah i did which means that like really? yeah i i've been telling for months my friends that i think something is gonna happen why based off what based on being on the gaza border a couple years before and seeing the way it goes on the border 
that something is going to happen. And I thought when it's going to break out, it's going to be a lot worse than what happened. I thought it's going to be Lebanon and Gaza together. I, was, I, there, was there something specific that happened? Something Hamas said? Something Lebanon said? Something Iran did that was, made you believe it? Was that? A, it was a few things. One, seeing the videos that there's protests on the f like Fridays where they come all the way to the border. When I was there in 2017, 18, if anyone came about 300 meters from the border, we were able to shoot towards them. We didn't kill them, but we were shooting towards them and they would go away. Now I've seen videos from before October 7th and they were standing on the border protesting. That for me was insane. Like I didn't understand how that could happen. And I, I definitely thought that the guard is a little down. And I just had a gut feeling that it's gonna happen because I knew their training and I knew their, their and everyone knew it. Like it's like gotta be dumb not to know it. So I I knew something is gonna happen, I just didn't know when. I remember there were a few incidents, I feel like, of them like peacefully protesting and then they were throwing Molotovs and then the news reported it as like, oh, Israel shoots peaceful protests, da da da. There was, there was, it was more than that. There was even a soldier who got shot when someone stuck his hand with a pistol through the border and killed a soldier on the spot. Really? Yeah, you can look it up. Wow. Um, so, old, and that happened already a year before October 7th. Right. So like I felt that they don't like, it's not as protected as it should be, but I, I, I can't get into politics because I don't know all the reasoning behind it. Um, so I felt something's gonna happen. So on October 7th, I was in Shiel. It's the first day of Simchas Torah. I went to Shiel, I'm davening in the, there's only one Shiel New Square, and I'm in there in the big Shiel. And then one of the guys, um, a Hatzalah member actually, he comes and he's like, hey Chaim, what's going on in Israel? I'm like, I don't know, you tell me. He's like, the, Atzola, the guy from Atzola is saying that there's 100 people killed. I said, that makes no sense. I don't think that's true. About 20 minutes later, it's about 11 o'clock. About 20 minutes later, he comes again. He's like, listen, he showed me news articles. There's 100 Israeli kills. I'm right. telling you, something is going on. Now, that for me was very, like, disbelief. But my gut is like, hey, you got to go home and check it out. Right. I walked home. I turned on my phone. And I have hundreds of messages from the soldiers beneath me and the commanders above me. Hey, where are you? We're on war. You got to come right now. Obviously, I, I, I was like, whoa, okay. My wife was standing right next to me and she saw, like she heard it in the panicked voice notes and messages. And it's already in the middle of the day in Israel at that time. And I looked at her and I was like, I think I got to go. And she's like, yeah. Like, this is real. So I had no idea where I'm going. I just took off towards JFK and just was driving towards the airport. And I said, I will be on the next flight to Israel. I didn't take anything. I was just like, I'm going to the airport. On the way, I was talking to friends, to the Israeli consul, figuring out how I will get there. Arriving at the airport, um, after probably an hour or two, there was more and more soldiers arriving and everyone's like, hey, we want to be. Um, Matzah Shab was the first flight took off to Israel. It was a very, very sad flight. Most guys were soldiers who were going to fight. Um, they were trying to let mainly soldiers on. It was a crazy, like, crazy story. Okay, so I'm like in the line trying to get on the flight. Everyone's like showing how important they are that they have to get on the flight. So there's this two guys from a special forces unit in the idea of they're like telling this girl next to them, hey, we think we should stand before you in the line because we, we're going to fight right away. Our team is fighting. Maybe you move away for us. And she's like, my sister got killed today. Can I go before you? Oof. I was like, it was like, it was like, like really real there. Wow. Um, that shot them up <laughs> real quick, I'm sure. <laughs> it was very like, it was a very intense line. It's a mic drop moment. <laughs> yeah. Like, wow. So... Got got on the flight, arrived at, in, like, in Israel already Sunday morning, like Sunday middle of the day. Right away, my team already was up, nor like, up north. You because, say your team, but you haven't been there for a few years. So I did. So I actually did. I was in reserve, although I never, I, I, I don't think I ever posted about it or a lot of people knew about it. But I did reserve, for example, about two months before the war. I did a, a week of reserve yeah no like reserve I, I, was active, I was active I reserve i trained my guys i had the guys that i knew i'm gonna work with in case there's a war 
Oh wow. I had like I had my team, my job, what I know I'm gonna do. So my team already was up north because they didn't know if something's gonna happen up north or not. So we went up north, we were there for about a day, day and a half, Tuesday early morning we went down south, we started training, and then after a couple of days we went into Gaza. I just wanted to that's pretty wild. Yeah. It still gives me chills it took a while, hearing though, about this but day. But they didn't go to Gaza for a while. Right. So, the, so. that time we used to train. Some yeah. units got pushed. Um, Is that why? Straight. They didn't go in right away? I can't tell you, you why. Know. I don't know the reasoning. I know that my team was very happy that we got about a week, a little bit more to train. Because the equipment we got was very bad. Like Really? I did not have a bulletproof vest until a day before. Um, I bought... Like from my friends in America who donated, I bought new shoes for my whole team. The shoes we had weren't as good. Um, bulletproof vests, we got some uh, for my guys, better helmets. Like we were not really prepared. So like- You organized that yourself, like the donations. Yeah, so my on? friends don't, like I didn't, re- like my main focus was in training. I called a couple of friends. I was like, hey, I really need money. And this is the things I need. If you guys can help me, I'll talk to you once in two days. And just whenever you get the money, send it to me. That's all. I is know. that on the army, or is that because there was such a big amount of reservists that came up that it wouldn't be practically? Is that on the Israeli government, or is that is this such a, such a you know black swan moment, as they would say? That what are the odds that they ever thought they needed five hundred, whatever, three hundred and fifty thousand bulletproof vests, or whatever? Depends how you look at it. <laughs> you can look at it saying, "Hey, the army should have known that they might need one day three hundred fifty thousand. The intelligence should have been good enough to right. know that." And you could say that they never thought about it, but right. It's it's probably half fifty percent on the army, fifty percent on right. other reasoning. But yeah, they were also worried. I feel like that something would start up north, so they wanted to uh, like no, call but up that, as that's, that's a separate issue. Which means like my guys were in the beginning up north, but even if something is gonna happen up north, you should have had good enough equipment and in stock yeah, ready line, yeah. for everyone. Right. Like even today, we can still get better equipment for my unit. Like we have most things we need. But if we get called back, let's say next week, which is a very big possibility, if I have now a couple thousand dollars, there is things that I can buy that will make their life better. Right. So just going back to the question I had earlier, so I, I was just asking about Khan Yunus, let's say as an example. So the battlefield, is it constricted like mainly to like a force block radius and like the rest of it is like not as heavy or is the whole place just, I'm just so curious to okay. try to envision. So every, every unit gets their job. So I can't tell you what happened in Gaza Strip as a whole because I wasn't oh. the whole Gaza Strip. Okay. The, the locations I was in, most of them were very active while we were there. I believe after we left, some became a little easier or before we went in there, some were a little like, I don't, maybe, I don't know, because my team is a very complicated, basically my team is like a team of guys that are reservists with active duty soldiers. So I'll explain it a little bit better. So... In the IDF, there's something called commander's course, right? Commander's course is a four months course. We spoke about it earlier. That those guys in commander's course fight as a unit together while they're in commander's course. So let's say if a war breaks out while they're in commander's course, they're fighting as commander's course together. So, for example, those guys on October 7th were on base together as commander's course. They went right down to Beiri to fight and they lost... Seven guys, unfortunately, and they were fighting without bulletproof vests. They got even their like grenades. They got a couple hours later. Like they went That's to fight. Okay. That's very not okay. But they're like as commanders course. They go to fight from base in the middle of the course. They fight as commanders course. Now, in order to have a built team in the army, there's a lot of other things you need. So, for example, my team in the beginning was uh, like a missile kind of team. Like you know, like easiest example. You know the javelin. It's like a type of like a shoulder missile yes, that could yes. go very far. Yes. So my team specialized in that. But there's like snipers and vehicles. And right. All those jobs, you need to train quite a few months to be good at that. So in commander's course, there's no one who is good at that, right? Because they're all becoming commanders and that's their job. So we are backing them up with specialties to use in the battlefield well, they're the regular soldiers fighting. So we're kind of reservists with... A regular active team. So we got a little bit, we were a little bit more in the front than all the other reservists, in a way. I was seeing, like, 
conflicting reports about how bad, let's just say, the damage is in Gaza, just overall. Like, obviously, it seems clear there are videos of absolute total destruction. And then you see videos of, like, no, this doesn't look so bad. And, and then you're seeing, like, reports. You can't trust anything in news, in the news. Well, you were there in person. So, I mean, how badly, how bad is the destruction over the actual entirety of Gaza, okay. infrastructure-wise? Let's start about before... Before destruction, how it was before. Yes. I walked into houses in Gaza that I wish my house would have looked like that. Really? There's houses with private pools. 10, 15 bedrooms. Like, insanely nice houses. And I'm talking insanely nice houses. And I was like, that's in Gaza? Like, trees around. Like, ins- I'll show you some pictures if you want. Insanely nice houses. Really? So to clarify, not in a concentration Gaza. camp. <laughs> They're so far from a concentration. Like, I was... Probably one of the biggest surprises that I had in Gaza was seeing such nice neighborhoods. Like I'm talking like well organized, perfect, nice. Sometimes you can still see that it's in Gaza. So for example, a lot of the houses have like a kind of built wall around them to like kind of like enclosure it as private. I don't know if it's because privacy or people shouldn't rob them. Uh, I honestly don't know the reason for that, but you can see that some... Most houses don't have any chairs. So you see like cushioning on the floor, like where they in sit. In the houses? In the houses. By a table? No table. Is that their culture? Their or culture. So? Their oh, culture. Okay. So like you can still see inside that it's in Gaza. Interesting. But. They sit on the, the floor when they eat? Yeah. And like mattresses on, around. Like very, like it's a very different style. I've never seen it before. Or some bathrooms, right? You would imagine the bathroom seat, right? Not on the floor. I would say 50% of the houses had an, a nice bathroom. It's just on the floor and like, like, a, like I should have taken a picture from it. Like, it's like, it's like a bathroom that you can flush, but it's on the floor. That like they kind like of like, why do they make themselves so uncomfortable? I just don't understand. I, I, How are you meant I to be on your phone? Know, but that's the, that's the style. And, and they're not cheap. So like, they definitely have money for it. It's just, that's the way they build it for some reason. I believe that's in their culture. But they had some nice houses, like very nice houses. Now, in terms of destruction, it really depends on the neighborhood. Some neighborhoods... Um, we had to destroy. So, for example, we found more than one, more than two under houses tunnels. Like I've seen in a kid's bedroom a tunnel, to, like going under. So, obviously, those houses we have to destroy. If there is a chain of tunnels and we don't know exactly which house it's coming from, we have to destroy Better safe than that sorry. block because, like, if we're gonna stay there or if we're trying to clean it out, we have to make sure no one's gonna pop on us. From any you guys house. doing door to door? Is this like a door to door clean out, like Pesach cleaning? We don't do door to door. We do a hallway. <laughs> <Some terrorists. laughs> I'm serious. I'm just curious right. how it so works. We don't do door to door because a lot of doors were booby trapped. A lot of them. So we do um, wall to wall. So I mean, let's say we would good. go from this building to the next building through making a hole, hole the in the wall. And ah, then right. whatever. That sounds but insanely stressful. We, we do have to clean all the houses. Um, and not just the houses we're in. So let's say if we're going to be in this house, we're going to have to clean the houses around because they're way too close for us. You know what's interesting? I haven't seen this report, and I was just thinking this the other day. No one's talked about the fact that the uh, missile strikes from Gaza have largely stopped. That hasn't been something right. that's really been talked about much, and especially with the whole entire world basically saying that you can't really stop Hamas and they're always going to be there. It, it seems like it's just about stopped. Is that not accurate? Like that has gotten totally under control. It, it is definitely a lot uh, weaker than it was before. Yeah, it's almost totally stopped. We should still continue and finish it off. I don't think we're done yet. I think we should, you know, find every tunnel and what, whatever it takes, find them. I do think it's necessary to do it in order for another October 7th not to happen. Amen. Do you agree um, with BB, let's say, as far as going into Rafa? Is that like a no-brainer to you? So BB is a very complicated question for me. I did like BB before the war a lot more than I do um, respect him now. Really? Is it about trusting him with security? Is that um, the thing that changed? Not just that. In a way, I think he... Well, he's the leader. So, And, and if that happened under his watch, he is... The buck stops somewhere. He, he, he's, he's somewhere. Like he's, an, I, he's not the only one. It's, it's, there's a, a lot more people than just him at fault for that, but... He is definitely part of uh, someone who has to say how this could have happened under his watch. And it's not someone you can say that went into power 
half a year before the war. This guy's been in and out of power for the last 15, yeah, 20, I don't and know, he was 20 the years, security more guy. than 20 years. And he was the guy and he was always saying that he's very good on military and that happened under his watch. So he definitely should think about some of the, the decisions he made in the last 20 years. But I do think the IDF has to go into Rafah in order um, to clean Hamas. Um, and based, if you just look at what the hostages who we got back already are saying, you understand that we have to go in. So, for example, a lot of the hostages who got back are saying that they were walking from one side of Gaza to the other side of Gaza with the terrorists kind of passing from city to city, which means that the other 130 hostages that there are now in are probably doing the same. So, so they went from the north to the south, right, basically. Right. So, I mean... If we want to find them and find the Hamas leaders, we should go in there. Obviously, I don't think all the 1.5 million people are in there should die. That's obviously not what we want. And, and the last thing I want is to kill anyone who's not supposed to die. But we should drag them down and clean them. Do you think he's still in Gaza? Um, Hania, whatever his name is. Sinwar, yeah. you're talking about? Sinwar. Sinwar. That's, yeah, yeah, Sinwar. I can't tell you for sure if he's in or not. I don't know. Um, it's very possible. It's very, very possible that he's in Egypt. Um, I believe they have tunnels from Rafa to Egypt. And he might have taken a flight from there somewhere out. I don't know. It's hard, I mean, maybe. Yeah. I'm not an intelligence guy. I don't know. I get orders and that's what I do. It sounds like you don't agree with the way Nasselli BB even went about the war. Forget about the actual failure of intelligence. Is that... Yeah. What, what about the war specifically do you not think was done properly and what would you have done i guess first of all every day i'm thanking god that it's not my responsibility <laughs> like <laughs> i am very happy that's not on me um but what i would do i think well here's my belief from before i think israel could have killed the hamas leaders before this war broke out i just think the reason they didn't do it is because there is so many different terrorist groups in gaza and israel rather wanted someone kind of who keeps them in check um and that's why they didn't kill them until now that's what i think and i think they should have done it um i think israel should have never went out of gaza back in 2000 as a failed experiment i think i think let's say even though we had back then one or two deaths like one of two one or two jewish people getting killed a year that's still in 20 years about 40 50 yeah, obviously. and not over a thousand so, yeah, and there was also international pressure on that decision. Like that was also right, a so, good faith thing. Oh, let's see what happens. And do you know what? Israel was proved right. At the end of the day, originally they were saying how, oh yeah, it's gonna become, it could become this paradise and they didn't. They built rockets and tunnels. Right, but international pressure is a different category we should talk about because I don't think international pressure should matter in any way. Because look at now, like they killed and raped Hundreds, hundreds of Jewish people, and for no reason. Did you see the picture they wanted? Like they wanted. Yeah, I saw. saw that? Of, yeah, of the German girl. That's right. The one on a wall. Right. It was disgusting. What it happened? Was there is, actual there is a picture of terrorists celebrating with an Israeli girl's dead body. Yeah, man, it's a famous and, one. Right, and that won an award in the last couple of days. Hey, who? Um, we some, can look it up. Some, some kind of very famous photo thing. international photographer. And it's a, like all over the world. It's like it's like a the success. Shani Luke picture. Yeah. Yes, it, incredible news source gave yeah, it an award. Yeah, yeah, Look it up. You, you can look for it up. What? What's the award? Greatest picture know. for the greatest like, picture of the, like, the, the hundred. One of the hundred best pictures of the year. What the fuck? That is that is insane. It's actually disgraceful. Like I would never had a problem. Like I don't. I've seen any way one of my guys would have done something like that. Like yeah. in no way. And obviously, you know, it, it's obvious. And if they. And so we don't have the international support either way. Right. We don't have, so why should I consider piece, that? Yeah. Like At this point. If you, like, what do I mean at this point? You, you never anyone, had. Yeah, you think anyone realized that like six months in, they're going to completely abandon Israel the way they did? Like someone like Chuck I Schumer? I thought so. Yeah, yeah. No, you knew yeah. it was changing, of course. Yeah. So it was a matter of time. Yeah. I so like, some people had some back. No. Some people couldn't, couldn't set it on October 7th. Right. Yeah, but like was... people are not gonna support you either way. So why like like let's say if you tell me in our first meeting, hey Chaim, I hate you, why then, would I care about like, you? you? Like yeah. you like you you're not you're not important to me in any way. And we know we're fighting for our survival, so it doesn't matter what it is and, and we'll we'll outlive them, we'll fight and we'll win it anyway in the end. So we should have done it back back in the day. I, I wanted to just ask one other thing. So we spoke about the wealthy the, the actual <laughs> wealth that's in Gaza. 
I assume not everyone's wealthy. What's the poverty like? Is there like majority of yours poverty or, or it's a regular place? And yeah, you obviously have neighborhoods, let's say comparatively, let's just call it, I don't know, Brownsville in New York. Look, I was, <laughs> someone's coming off to you for that. I don't give a shit. Like, it's like, poor ass I don't know. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you about neighbors I have been, which is like Sajaya, Jukharadik, Khanunas. They have really, really nice houses. Um, most neighbors that I was in looked very decent. Like, they look like in their good days, they look better than Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I don't more, know. More or less panels in New York. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know how bad they are. To me, it didn't look that bad. Maybe some neighborhoods did, and maybe Hamas was mostly in the better neighborhoods, and that's why I was there. I can't tell you that, because in the end, you can see that Ismail Ani is worth over $7 billion. That is a lot more money that most people that I know have. So right. they also have a crazy standard of living that like no one talks about. It. In fact, they have like 30 plus hospitals and stuff like that. It's a crazy high standard of living. They have an insane good way of living. Do they really? Yes. Yes. And and if you go in, you, you'll see it. Like they're, they're not like, <laughs> like a lot of the pictures look very bad, but they're so far from reality. Like if you're there and you see it. Is that still the case or the answer is at this point? No. Well, I, I haven't been a Rafa and every time I went in somewhere it was... It was after the civilians were cleared out. And obviously we kind of make a mess and not because we want to make a mess, just we want to find the rockets. We want to find the tunnels and that's part of the job to make a mess. So after we left, it didn't look as nice, but you can definitely see that they were really nice neighborhoods. What do you think as far as Israel? I mean, how long do you think this is going to take to me and you? I don't know. I believe it's going to take, I believe it's going to take a while, minimum of another six months. So the other thing I would ask is, do you think Israel has to, quote unquote, occupy the Gaza like they do with the West Bank in order to make sure that there's I don't no know. caliphate? Let's I don't it. know if it's an occupation. What means an occupation? Ignore the word of that word. Much I'm like just it. asking. Yeah. We, we can get into that in one second. I'm not referring to that. Right. I'm just saying what we're the way we have security, if that sounds better for the sake of this conversation, in the West Bank. And who said the West Bank is an occupation? It's a whole different concept. Right. We can argue that from today till next year. I'm not asking that, though. We can talk about it in a second. The way we handle security in the West Bank, do you feel that Israel sh is going to have to stick around the Gaza Strip, let's just say for another five to 10 years, and have the same type of security to make sure there's no caliphate or vacuum, let's call it, AKA ISIS after right. Saddam Hussein, Iraq, whatever, all that stuff. Is that what's gonna be necessary? Is this a 10 year play? I think Israel should do more than they do now. I never, so as a soldier in my whole years, I never operated in the West Bank other than missions here and there, let's say. I'm, most amount of time I was in the West Bank was about 30 days. A couple of missions in and out. So I can never had, like, you know, there's guys who did most of the service guarding in the West Bank. My unit never did that. So I can't tell you about that um, as much as other guys would be able to tell you. But I think we should do more because if there is still a lot of weapons in the West Bank and you just had, let's say, you have terrorist attacks now. Almost well, every day we talk about it. Like you yeah. had last week on Friday, a, a guy, like a sniper, shooting at 12 Israelis and killing one soldier, right? Right. So how do they have a weapon over there? If Israel is really in there as much as they should, you would have never gotten well, I mean, weapons. We're never going to be able to eliminate every single weapon. I mean, Why it's, not? it's a nice idea. Why not? I mean, just practically it's... But, but that's not the point of my... I'm just asking if you think that Israel has to keep a security presence in Gaza. Because most people think right now that the war is going to end and Israel is going to leave. And to me, that's like an Islamic Jihad or Palestine. What's it called? Is that what it is? It's yeah. I don't know. I don't... They're not going to take over. Like, it's just going to be the next Hamas. Like, granted, it's not called Hamas. But, like, how are we going to at well, least... Even the PA is not that much better, as you say, the West Whatever Bank. Whatever it is. Right. I'm I, saying... Right. I don't know what leaving means. What I do want is... I want, when this is over, to be able to go to sleep at night without a gun under my pillow. Or myself, when I'm not on the border right now, that the guys who live there and the kids who were raised there should have a calmer life. Right. And we right. should do... Even in Gaza itself, you mean? Or you mean in everywhere. Israel? Everywhere. In Israel and in Gaza. Right. Not just like... I want every kid in this world should be able to go to sleep knowing that he's not going to get shot up at night. It doesn't matter if he's in Gaza or if he's in Israel or wherever he is. Um, and, I think, and I think in order for that to happen, there's a lot more work who has to get done. And work like this take a while. So, for example, we need to start by the education. Who are the teachers? Who are the schools, right? You can see now that a lot of the teachers in UNRWA, which is like the UN school, were actual terrorists. Right. And like, we can't have that happen again. 
Right. So, Lewis, so what, what, drums, whatever right. has to get done should be done and it should get done right now. I believe going out um, from Gaza in a fast way will look like when America left Afghanistan, Afghanistan which is only a bigger disaster at the moment. Yeah. So we have to leave in a very smart and careful way and do whatever we can that this shouldn't happen again. You mentioned that you don't think it's an occupation. Can we just talk about that? I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts. And I'm not necessarily in disagreement or agreement. I just want to hear your... Right. First of all, um, there is, Gaza has a border with Egypt. Yes. Which is one of the most secure borders there is in this world. Yes. If people from Gaza want to go out or in, they can go through Egypt. Right. Israel oh, no, has... Fine. So let's Israel, talk, let's those are two Gaza. different things. I'm not talking right. about Gaza. Let's just refer to fine. Gaza, right. Israel doesn't occupy, right. Sorry. Back that up. Okay, I'm talking so about the West Bank. Forget Bank. about Gaza. I agree with you Did on you Gaza. Did you occupy it from who? What's the question? Saying. It's occupied from who? You're saying because there's no Palestine. You're saying there was, there was never Palestine. I got it. It was Jordan and then we took it and they don't yeah. even want it. Uh, right. Okay. So okay. If, if, I don't know. Like, honestly, a two-state solution for me is very confusing. It's never going to happen. And, and, really and, confusing. and, and I'll tell you why. If you look back 50 years ago, right, by the Yom Kippur War, who was the biggest enemy to Israel? Egypt. 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 Yeah. And fortunately now, we don't fight with them as much, right? Well, Maybe never. politically we're not friends, but they don't shoot at us. We right. don't shoot at them. And I hope they're not going to attack us any day. So I, I think and I'm praying that peace could happen one day. And I, and I want peace to happen everywhere. What, what it's going to take for me to be comfortable with um, the West Bank to have their own government. I don't know. At the moment, I'm very uncomfortable. If you see the people there now, and when they're still saying that all they want is to kill Jews, obviously you can't make any peace with that's them. That's what I'm you're right. So that's what I'm asking. We, the way we were raised, right? And there's always been conflict. Now I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Actually, the way we were raised is that you know, Ace of Sona Yaakov, you know, right. and these people just hate us. And if you believe the concept that it's a metaphysical thing, that it's just the world the way the world is, then you believe peace will never be possible. Yet. Peace has happened between Arabs and Jews and whatever, but it's almost like there's a piece of me that one thing, one part of me thinks that like the Palestinians, which is peace is just never going to happen. There's just there's no concessions that they're ever going to like at, at their bones. They want Israel gone. They just want to kill all Jews. And I'm and the other side of me right. says no, that's not necessarily true. Like I'm not just going to be a Shivish guy that just believes that maybe peace is actually doable and and. So what's your... So I really hope one day we'll live calm and easy and have a, a normal life. How this is going to happen, I can't tell you. I don't know. I think it has to come more from the Palestinian side at the moment. Because most Israelis want to live in peace. 100%. And the biggest time I would say that I can bring to that is look before October 7. The most villages next to the Gaza border peace are not right wing. Yeah. Like, they were really, really not right-wing. And you can say there's a story of this artist, right, that was working with guys in Gaza yeah. about paintings and stuff. And then on the day of October 7, they were asking her, hey, where are the soldiers? What's going on? Like, you know, and, right. and all those kind of things. But if you look at other sides, for example, Egypt, that doesn't happen at the moment. So right. I think it has to start on their side by stopping to teach in the schools how bad Israel is and that Israel will go away because Israel will not go away. Right. It doesn't matter what they do. Israel is here to stay. Now, we got to figure out the way of how to live um, in a good way and, and just be able to wake up and work and, and do whatever we got to do. If you look at even the history of America, right, we have the biggest civil war that there was out there, I think, right? There was people yeah. from both sides killing each other. And now... We're one big country, so I don't know what's going to happen in the end and how it's going to work out. But I do want my kids to get raised and have a, an easier life than we do. Do you think the resistance when Israel went in uh, into the war, when you know when they entered ground troops, do you think that was more or less than expected? Did they, did they have a harder or easier time than they expected to have? It was, a, I think it was as expected. It was. Yeah. So obviously, we don't want even one soldier to die, and it's very sad. And every guy died is, is, is you know, is a big deal and, and very, very sad. But unfortunately, the numbers we were talking before in the in our meetings, we kind of knew this is what's gonna happen. One of my the guys that I most look up to, um, his name is Haravo Shefridman, which is he's a ra he's a rabbi now. He's like 
very, very holy person, but he was also, before he became a rabbi, he was a top general in the IDF. He was in charge of all the reserve guys. He could look him up, very interesting guy. He told me right before I went into Gaza with my guys, he was like, Chaim, I'm going to tell you this. You should know that when you go in, you are probably not going to meet guys face to face. They will come out from a tunnel behind you, shoot at you guys, and vanish back into it. And that is what happened. 100% that is what happened. Really? So we kind of knew what we're getting into, and we still had no choice. What is it like to that anxiety, right? It's almost like I've, I've watched about uh, the Viet Cong, and, mm -hmm. and you know, they were uh, the guerrilla warfare, like this style. What is it like, just anxiety, probably like you're just in a constant state of things, right? A fear that any step you take and any block, the next block you go to, that you haven't really cleared it, and really there's someone behind you. Right. What's that mental, like? So for some reason, in a weird way, I knew I'm coming back. Really? Yeah. I, 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 I told my wife and my friends, I am, co like, I knew I'm coming back. So I was very calm. About, like, I didn't think that I'm going to die. There was some scary moments and some of my friends died and I wasn't that far away from them when they did, unfortunately. But I don't know. I just felt God is with me and, and we'll just do whatever it is. Some days were very tough. Um, obviously, you know, you get attacked, you attack back. And some days were just like you sit around with the guys and waiting around. And some like we tried to wait for them, trick them. There was a lot of uh, things involved. Actually, I I'll mention a very crazy story that happened to my team. Mm -hmm. um, I was behind like, so we're a company of about 150 guys. So sometimes I was in the front, sometimes I was in the back. You know, I wasn't always right next to them when it happened. On this particular scenario, I was with the vehicles a little bit more in the back and we're like the medical um, evacuation team and, and just bring them supplies. They were going in to uh, Sajaya, okay? They were going in and as they're going in, um, one of the guys is very dirty. His name is Malkiel. Um, you can look him up. I think he said this story on, on the news a couple of times. He's very, very dirty. We're going in and it's in the afternoon. He is thinking when he's going to dive Mincha. He really is thinking when he's going to dive Mincha. So basically, to explain it a little bit better, there's guys, there's tanks in the front. Then there's us walking and there's, you know, more guys in the back. I was more in the back. He's thinking when he's going to dive Mincha. So as the tank stopped, he looked backwards to the other side to see when the sun is down, if he has time to dive him once we get in the house where we're supposed to get into. Or he should have him well walking, which obviously he wouldn't want. As he turns around and he sees the sun is almost down, he's like, okay, I'm going to start davening while we're walking. He starts like, look backwards, a little bit of prey, and out from behind the whole team, the ground, he sees the ground, it's like it's moving a little bit, a terrorist comes out with an RPG aiming at one of the tanks in front. They didn't know, they hear the tank stop, they didn't know there's a whole hundred guys walk on foot. He comes out with an RPG. This guy is davening Mincha. He sees the guy. He's looking the other way. He's looking the other way. Takes a shot. Clean. Guy fell down within a couple of seconds. Um, the whole team obviously were activated. You know, there was two other terrorists a little bit uh, in a different spot. It was like, Pure miracles, like it's that is wow. crazy. absolutely crazy. That's like this every red. Like you can't make this up. Like this is really so what he's happened. He's the only guy. 150 soldiers are walking this way, and he way, was and the he only around. guy who turns around. And well. why did why does he turn around? For because mincha. he went for mincha, and that, he started praying. It's literally every one of my Insane. childhood rebbies is and, and, thinking like, yeah. "Oh my gosh!" Like, yeah, do you hear I, this story? I, see, you have to love a mincha. Make sure, even when you're in the war zone, <laughs> I can like see them. Like, I can't tell you <laughs> if you have to or you have to, whatever. But this happened, and and. I wasn't far away from what happened, and I know the guy is a good friend of mine. And there's wow. like a few like insane like stories that I wouldn't believe that happened. That's crazy. And even though sometimes our life was saved, and I, I really believe it was because my family and friends were back home saying Tillam and praying and giving taking khal and all those things, I one hundred percent believe that saved a lot of lives. Like I I have no doubt like and I, and I say thank you, everyone who tells me they prayed for us. I say thank you because I, we had quite a few insane stories. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I don't know if you saw today, the Israeli Supreme Court passed a law saying that no more funding to Haredim and yeshivas if the kids right. don't go to the army. Is that something you're for or against? 
so that is a very interesting topic that we could talk about. Overall, I think the what's going on now with the Haredim joining or not joining is political. Um, and look at the guys leading this um, event are very, very political minded and trying to throw on the government. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you even more than that. I'll tell you, when I joined, it was right before, um, like, Tsuketan, right, the, the, the last war. I can't tell you for sure that if it would have been such a hack for Haredim to join, that I would have joined. Meaning to say that once you start saying you must, I think a lot less people will. And when you say, hey, we need your help, a lot more guys will join. They come from kindness. They come from kindness. And, and a lot of people want to help. And you can see even in the not Haredi world, right? Not everyone is joining. Like you can say, maybe by law they should, but there's hundreds of kids from, for example, Tel Aviv who are not joining the IDF. Uh, or is there it was, mandatory? Or, yes. Or there was they protests. Look at the protests like a year ago against Bibi. He had hundreds of former pilots and other people saying that doesn't matter what happens, we're not going for reserve as long as Bibi's not off, right? How was that okay that they're saying that we're not doing reserve anymore because Bibi is the prime minister? Okay, and now that Khaidim say because of their beliefs they're not joining, that's not okay. And it's the same people screaming both things. Now, I'm not saying that the Khaidim should not contribute. I think they should. But there is a lot of ways on, on, on helping. Like, you know, there is hundreds, if not thousands of Zaka volunteers who did an insanely good job. There's Hatzala members who is, you know, helps well, sa the, saving lives the every day. I thought the whole point is Haredim um, want to learn. Some Haredim should learn. Not, the army right. is not made for everyone. Like, like some people should learn. And then if you say they should go to the IDF after a couple of years learning, that's also okay. Like I had on my team two rabbis, right? Two rabbis who came to the IDF after um, learning in Shiva a couple of years, and they act as rabbis in our unit. Their job is a job that I would never want to do. Their job is, if in case, unfortunately, a soldier dies, they have to, like, they do, like, a Hevri Kedisha type of job, yeah. they have to clean it. Their job is to hype the morals a little bit, you know, like, those are chaplain. very, very, like, cha like chaplains. Those are very, very important jobs, and maybe a little bit more guys from the Haredis, like, you know, environment should join. But I think if you're not fighting it, that's going to happen automatically. If you're fighting it, it's going to push away the guys who do want to join as well. But also from the Torah element, it sounds like it made you feel better knowing people were davening for you and learning for you. Like, I feel like people in the army also get a bit of a, 100, a boost 100%, from people sitting in yeshiva and, and, learning Torah. Yeah, you can't underestimate what right. Chabad does all around the world. Every city you go to, is that not kind of a service for the Jewish country? It absolutely is. Right. So you have to see... Every boy on his case, what's the reason for, what shouldn't. And I believe there is Rabbonim who do push people to go. And that's a great thing. Right. It's, it's every case individual. Sounds like you've also my, found a nice middle. Like, I think there's the a beautiful middle. Yeah. yeah. My sister, shout out Tila. She wants, she's obsessed. She's going to the army. She's made up her mind. She's good for her. She'll love that I gave her a shout out. Hey. <laughs> good for her. And, and, and um, she should train. Yeah, she's, she's going to like, she's, yeah, she's very, very capable girl. Um, yeah. Let me ask you this. Mental health. Coming out of these war zones. First of all, how are you doing in that department? Well, I believe I'm doing okay. Um, It's very hard though. The, the toughest part for me was okay. One of my one of the guys in our unit died, um, and when they took out his body, they didn't take out all parts. When they took out his body, right? When we evacuated his body, some parts stayed behind, and we cleaned it afterwards. So uh, obviously, after it was pronounced. We go there, we take the other parts, and for some reason, I was the guy who took those parts to the Hevra Kedisha, that they should be buried with him. Just to clarify, I assume he stepped on a mine, this is a bomb, right. it's not this, a bullet. This is not a bullet, this is not a bullet, this is a bomb that exploded. Okay. Um, as I'm driving a car, a regular vehicle, and I have his body parts behind, and I'm just driving into Israel, right? Like driving to this and you see you know people going on their normal life and drinking and, and laughing and, and, and normal this was it was definitely kind of like 
not easy, you know, to see people continue the normal life while your friends are literally getting blown up. It was definitely very hard for me. Um, like that switch, you know, and and like other people. It's, love ex- yeah, spinning, it's just so. experiencing that and the 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 visions of that, the visuals of that. Something that's, I assume that's something that stays with you. Traumatizing, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's so far, I've been doing okay. I think I'll do fine because I've been an EMT for almost like more than 10 years. So oh, I've seen a lot. I've seen my fair share of things um, around. So I don't think that hits me as much as thinking that normal people, you know, everything was good in their life and they just had to go because we had to go do our job. And, and that's what happened. It hits me in a way, I think, that I kind of demand for myself a little more now. I feel like one for them and two you don't know how long you're going to be here. So like, I want to do like work a little (coughs) harder than everyone else. I want to try to make my wife a little more happy. Um, It it pushes me a little more. I feel that that you've seen how quick it could end and how sad there is that you want to help a little more. For sure. And what about your guys? You're a captain of how many people? So uh, started at about 25 (coughs) and then a little over 40. A little over 40 people. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure not all these people are able to handle it the same way. Is there... Right. Uh, is this something that your the army is pushing them to, let's see, a mental health counselor post this or a therapist? So is this something you when, do? When, when we got out, we had a meeting with a mental health counselor and the army did say they're going to give you a thousand shekel, thousand five hundred shekels, about three, four hundred dollars towards um, mental health counseling which is in a way enough, in a way not. However, where it's more difficult, I feel, is for the guys who come back to the United States, right? There's about, I would say, 500 or more soldiers who did fight in Gaza who live in the United States, and they don't have insurance for that, so there is an organization for that. There is an organization called Nivut. Yeah, I was going to ask you about they that. They do amazing stuff, insanely good stuff, and they are trying to help soldiers with those kind of issues. Um, What's your involvement again? I know that you're heavily involved in that. I'm, I'm trying to be very involved. Um, if it's taking some guys just out for lunch, or it, it, it could be from the smallest thing to just to someone would call you up that his friend is in bed for the last couple of days. And, and being a soldier or a fellow guy who was there, I can just show up at his house, take him out, even for a drink or to the shooting range or whatever. Yeah. It could totally help him. And sometimes you do got to send in more professionals. I had a while ago, someone was on the verge of uh, committing suicide and I went over and then someone else went over and I believe we, we really like saved those guys, this guy's life. It was heavy PTSD, bro. Um, yeah. So there is definitely a very good organization who helps. They obviously can use a lot more resources. Like, this is like, in America? This is in America. Um, they can, you know, they can use more help uh, financially and maybe, you know, more people getting involved. But Are you part of the staff sorry, or management? I am unofficially part of the staff. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Which is, I'm not, like, I don't have a title over there, but I, I am involved. What do they do? Trying to help. Like, aside from, like, other events? They, they, they have events, gatherings. Sometimes it could be just having, I don't know, playing pool with the guys. Right. You take out eight guys and then you figure, hey, this guy has a problem. Or some guys, in a way... A lot of soldiers feel that no one could understand them unless you were there. Right. Um, it's probably true. Which is fair enough, so, I was going to say. Is, right, which is, which is very true in a way. So sometimes just having a nice dinner together could take a guy from step A to a whole different mindset, yeah. mindset so nice. in life by just talking to someone. And sometimes, sometimes you got to pay for mental health if it's a lot of different ways of helping that. Um, if it's by yoga, by meditation, lately some kind of, uh, uh, you know, more chemicals are getting involved. Sure. It's definitely not for everyone, but some guys, that's really what helps them. All right, everybody, want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor for this episode, Ice Shaker Incorporated. For those of you that have been following Mislabeled, you know that we have Chris Gronkowski on. Uh, this is his company. They were on Shark Tank, offered a deal by all five sharks. They have sold over 1 million bottles to date. Kitchen grade stainless steel, which does not absorb odor like all plastic bottles do. If you are a workout junkie, this product is for you. Third party tested. 
will hold ice for 30 plus hours and keep, keep your drink cold. Additionally, this is customizable for all employers for their employees and can make for a great gift for a friend. Turnaround time on custom bottles is three to five business days. To reach out to them, you can hit them via email, info at iceshaker.com. That's I-N-F-O at I-C-E-S-H-A-K-E-R.com. Or reach them by phone, 817-329-6478. Again, that's 817 817- 329-6478. A customer rep will direct you to the correct sales department. Now back to our episode. I saw someone someone I follow on Instagram is like, she's studying um, the mushrooms mm-hmm. to help soldiers with PTSD. Like she did a fundraiser and whatever. Um, and apparently it, it's making moves in the right direction. I don't know. And like, I'm sure it's helping some guys. I I have no doubt. Like it could help a lot of guys probably. I just think it's you incredible gotta, that everyone's thinking so like outside the box of being like, yo, let's just get together as a grassroots right. level, as a people, like I'm Israel. Like, I yeah. think that's amazing. It's, it's, we can still do more. I think that we do. Always. Everyone could. Um, as guys are coming back, there's different issues coming up. I'll just give you an example. One of the guys that I knew from Gaza left a wife and four kids behind, which is very sad. I think the oldest daughter is like maybe 10. They're from here? They're not from here. But... They needed something at home very urgent. Like one of the, I'm not going to say too many details because I obviously don't want to get back to them. Um, they needed one of the very important supplies every Jewish house should have and they didn't have it and it cost uh, a couple thousand dollars. I called up some of my friends within a day. Um, they donated it and it's going to get delivered to their house in the next day or two. Um, so there's like, there's a lot of important things happening in that that people do help those also in that case i wish i can have like i wish like i wish i would have more money to give them or my friends would have more money to give them which is a very important need but then everyone has their role as well like people in america let's say can feel involved right. and say okay i'm doing something important so i'm going to vote sounds like yeah this is very very important stuff the fine uh, the last question I, I i do have about the war is from your perspective having been there do you feel it is possible to eliminate hamas and i'm not referring necessarily to the ideology as far as them being a governing party. Yeah. You do. Yeah, one hundred percent. If you we destroyed most of their buildings. Um the, the ones I've seen, like if it's their like courthouses and headquarters and the hospital, for example, and all those. What's going on in Shiva? I actually wanted to ask. I'm trying to understand what the hell is happening. It was a whole international thing, almost like it is right now with going into Rafa about Shifa like two three months right. ago, maybe. And then they went in there. And they found whatever it was, the tunnel underneath, et cetera, et cetera, and they showed that. But then they left, and you don't hear anything, and all of a sudden they're doing an Operation Chief where they catch 9,000 terrorists, and I'm like, what the hell right. is happening here? This was a very, very successful event for the IDF. So basically what happened, as far as my understanding, because I wasn't there, um, by the time that happened, I was, in a diff- I was on my way out already the second time it happened. First time it was not far, but the second time I wasn't there anymore. Um, we went there, kind of tried to clean it, and obviously most terrorists knew we were coming, so they left. However, since we were not allowed to destroy the buildings because it's a hospital and we do don't want to we want to try not to destroy hospitals, after we left, they went back. So they did a very good operation and just in one night went surrounded the hospital again, kind of locked them in. And that's when on the second time we got a lot of terrorists. They didn't think we we're going to go back again. So you're saying the infrastructure was still basically left there the first time around? Yes. What about the what about the patients? They weren't there the second time around? There was. So they didn't just kill anyone in the building. They they kind of surrounded the building and very slowly and like like a very... Methodical. Like, you know, like an, like an operation you do very like precise, small night, yeah. precise, a very precise mission of doing they call what like to do. 500. Like, where are these people hanging out? And there's massive those tunnels those buildings are very big. So if you've seen a hospital, a hospital is very big. Hospitals in Gaza are huge. They're not Same. like a, a, a like I think people think as Gaza as like this small place where there's like two million people squeezed in. That's what they it's say. Not. It's not. It's really not. Like that I said before, possible. the buildings are beautiful. Big buildings, nice buildings. Their life is not as bad as people think outside. So in those buildings, there is room for nine thousand people, and Look at the pictures. You see them outside. You see them, you know, standing next to each other. But there is a lot of room in there for a lot of people 
Where are they hiding? Are these people underneath or are they just like chilling in like... Both. Right. Because you can't take like... Like we had, right? A terrorist in Gaza does not walk around in Hamas uniform with an AK-47. I wish they would have done it. it would have so made how do you life know f- who is a terrorist? A, exactly. So you got to surround the place, take out one by one and check them. Because if someone is wearing a guy in his... A guy, let's say, who's 35 years old, right? Wearing a medical suit... You don't know if he's a terrorist or not. So what are they doing? Facial ID recognition? How are they so they, they take the visual out, they ask them questions, they have interpreters, figure out who they are and build a profile. And that's how they know who's a terrorist and who's not. And that's a very... What's stopping a guy from saying that he's a grocery store cashier and whatever and them not knowing? That's why the, that's a part of the intelligence job. They do that. They do their job and they do it as good as they could. Right. I just want to point out that this is also why Israel's the most moral army in the world. People are like, oh no, there's so many civilian right. casualties. If this was the USA or even Great Britain, they would bomb the hell out of it, right? A Look, hospital loses its status the second after there's a single military person in there. How many how many civilians really died crazy. on D-Day? Hundreds of thousands. How many civilians died in Hiroshima? Or, in, well, or I mean, Dresden, <laughs> World like, War II, Dresden. Way, 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 way more than Israel would ever kill. And, so and, and that makes it so complicated Which is and the so most, hard. That's why it also pisses me off the most. And I think I don't think I'm the only one here of that. Israel has this like reputation of being like so terrible. Bro, literally no one has the numbers that Israel has of like civilian to terrorist ratio. It doesn't right. exist an army in, in urban warfare like right. how Israel and, too. And they had a story uh, about a week ago, I saw it somewhere, about... 71% of people in Gaza said that whatever happened on October 7 was a good thing. Yes. And that is very, like, you understand what that means? And what happened on October 7? They like literally 71. came in to a festival and killed everyone and raped all the girls. It's, like, this is like insane like, it's like stuff. It's like 70% of Afghanistan basically saying yeah. 9-11 yeah. was a good it, thing. It's, that no, is, I'm that, with like, you. It's off the wall. Obviously, we shouldn't kill civilians and we really, really shouldn't. But it is very hard to fight with people who all they want is to kill you. And th- this problem starts in the schools. And we should start by rebuilding the schools over there and teaching people that there could be life in a good way. And when You're people, and a, sorry. like Golda Meir said once, where they're going to start loving yeah. their kids more than they hate us, we'll have peace. But you're saying also that like the Gazan civilians have a bit more responsibility than people are saying. Right? The world is saying, oh, it's half children, whatever. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. Again, even though it's children, we shouldn't kill them. But still, you have to take in account that, for example, one of my friends saw a kid who's about fourteen years old shooting at him with an AK forty-seven. Really? Now, obviously, in this case, he had to take a shot, right? Because it's going to be or <laughs> you or him. You're obviously going to make sure that he goes. But if this kid would have walked on the street, you would have never taken a shot at him. And we didn't, and that's why he could do what he did. Or, for example, we saw with the drones a lady walking with a big kind of backpack, right? Carrying a big backpack. And for some reason, something looked a little off, so they followed her. And she just goes next to a building, puts down that sack, and continues her way. Which was very odd, so we stayed, like we had a drone above there to look what's going on. An hour later, you see a tunnel opening up, a terrorist coming out and taking this food in. Really? So, Holy all the, like, and, and we couldn't kill her because we, we you can't. It, it, it's just an innocent woman and all she had was food. But what they're doing is, if she gives food for a terrorist, she is making him to be able to continue fighting another month or two or whatever, how long this food's going to take And that child him. with the AK-47 goes down as, oh, another child casualty. Uh, obviously, you're going to see pictures of that child and everything. That's that's obvious. Or there was a team um, next to us that had 175 people coming towards them with their hands raised, women and kids with their hands raised that they want to surrender, right? As they're coming close, eight or nine terrorists pop out in between those uh, this group and start shooting at the soldiers who kind of let them come close. And three soldiers died over there, which is... Obviously, very sad, but this is not, like this, nothing. This you can is what do. they're doing. Or, yeah. or a guy that told me that he saw a lady, like not not a lady, saw a guy holding someone's shoulder like this, kind of keeping it there, and then putting the gun on her shoulder right. and shooting at the soldier. Like human shield from the movie. Like, like this is insane stuff. Obviously, you know, he took a shot, and he tells me, "I feel very guilty about taking 
this shot, but Self this defense. is the insane stuff they do. Got it. So you mentioned uh, regarding BB, you became not as much of a fan. Yeah. Um, do you think he's in it for the, first of all, I'm slightly curious why, but also do you think he's a guy that's just in it for the power or there's a part of him that he's doing it for the right reasons and he feels he has the answers? So I can't tell you what's in his head, why he's doing it. I don't know. Um, I've oh, never met not? him face to face. My gut feeling is that he wanted to do good in the beginning and he still believes that he does the right thing. But obviously, this war has proven that it's time for someone new and new ideas to come in. Because um, I don't think he learned his lesson good enough. What do you mean by that? I, what I just want to understand is that, look, I don't know a lot about Isra Israeli politics. I'll be the mm -hmm. first one to admit that. And I'm sure if I study more, it's very possible I would mm -hmm. learn a lot more things. But as a random person who has like a decent overview of politics, I listen to all the leaders, right, of different countries right. on a more general level. And I hear BB and I'm like... The, like his poise and his strength and leadership and his uh, knowledge, he doesn't back down. Like to me, he seems like the quintessential leader. Like we would be lucky, I feel like in America, to have a guy like that leading the way. That's how what my, goes through my brain. Um, and it seems like he has a moral clarity. Right. And then I hear people saying definitely what you're saying. You're far from the first person to say this. And I'm just like, where am I missing something? So in the beginning, it was very good. When, when, when he is political career. Now, he was insane good, but with time, there's a lot of um, people who don't like him as much. And as a good politician, he did his ways around it, right? To make to make sure people like him more, to stay in power, for his belief probably that this is going to make Israel a better state. But in this process, he did a lot of mistakes. So I'll give you an example. The, Israel used to create their own ammunition, and they don't anymore. The last couple of years, they buy old ammunition. They stop. The all the Israeli factories who build ammunition kind of closed down. Um, they had like IWI, Intel, like all those companies who built like the Iron Dome and more like tactical weapons. But I'm talking the actual bombs, the actual right. ammunition. Israel stopped building. There's a lot of reasons for it, but if if that happened under Bibi's watch in the last 20 years, I think that's a problem. Okay. Doesn't matter what the reasoning why it had to stop is. Because you can't be a country leader and have to think now, oh, maybe America is not going to sell me weapons anymore. Right. You should think about that and you should have and your own is. factories. You should not have to think what other countries My only question is, you don't think you. he has a cheshbon for that? Like calculation? Like he's not an idiot. He had a cheshbon, but it got lost. He was, again, he, was very, he did a lot of great things and he was very good. But I think it's time for a right. new leadership. Um, same thing. Same oh. thing with the military. I think a lot of the the military leaders the last couple of years, especially the ones who are now in politics, they should also go home. I think if you're the head of the IDF in the last couple of years, and this is what happened now, you should not be in politics because clearly they're saying that it's Bibi's fault. He was calling the shots. He's saying that it's their fault. It doesn't matter. I think you should both go home. Right. And and. Who do you see as the next person? You said not Bibi. You ready for the next person? Is that Benny Gans? Is it someone um, with no. military experience? No, no, I think I think I think Benny Gans is also not the solution. So there's there's a some people in the Israeli politics who uh, they're keeping them very low. So for example, there's a guy named Nir Barkat. He was the mayor of Jerusalem. I believe one of the most successful mayors Jerusalem ever had. He's now in politics. The guy was very successful in his military service. Great businessman. Does amazing stuff in the business world, but now as a politician, because he's under Bibi's party, he never got the spotlight. I think a guy like him should go forward a little stronger. Is he stronger. more centrist? He is more right right center, kind of, in a way. Okay. Um, and I think there's other guys that because Bibi and those guys are so loud, they don't have a room to grow in. But I think they their voices should become a little stronger and they should start... I guess the question in. comes up though, but then is it possible because if you, let's say, get rid of that coalition of right now of the mm -hmm. right wing, is it suddenly going to be, okay, now the left wing coalition is going to come in. Now that old unity government that wants to, uh, you know, put all the yeshiva, go like doesn't want to have uh, part of that protest movement, right? They did wanted to have um, like no, like stoppages on Shabbos and stuff like that, right? There's a big contingent on the left that want to say, listen, Israel's a secular state and like completely get rid of that like religious identity. Again, so I'm thinking there should be new parties. 
at all. Like I think the parties who lead in the last couple of years should not be in power because they led to failure. Obviously, I don't want the left to be in power, but I think there should be new leaders. It's a new generation and new people should come up. On the left and, and the right. You mentioned something about um, uh, bosses on, on Shabbos, right? Mm -hmm. That is a very, very interesting topic. And, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll, we can go into it yeah, if you I want. I love it. So obviously, if we go, if we look at Israel as an Israeli, as, as a Jewish state, there might be an issue with it, right? Because a Jewish state shouldn't have bosses on Shabbos. But on the other side, how many people in Tel Aviv are Shomer Shabbos? Very few. Very few. Now, how can you tell them that they're paying tax and they're doing their military service as they should? They barely know what Judaism is from school. It's not like they became not religious right. or they're like the rebellious thing. They they never they were never no connected concept, to yeah. Judaism. They never they don't have any connection. And how can you explain them that they should not have a boss on Shabbos? They don't understand the difference. Like how should they understand? No one ever taught them that. So obviously they're gonna hate the government who doesn't let them have a boss on Shabbos. And that's something the Haredi parties should think about. It's not like you have a kid who grew up in Satmer who's not religious now, right? right? It's a guy who never grew up. His great grandfather was not religious. Right. So how are you gonna tell him like, that makes no sense. I think people are worried though as well. I agree with you. Like it's a reasonable thing, right? When you take item by item. But I think people are also worried that it'll become, it'll snowball into something else. Into now, what? In other words, let's say cautious laws, marriage laws, things. And not only that, Yidna are worried because that they have an achrayas, they have a responsibility to other Jews. Even if this Jew um, doesn't know that they're doing, let's say, something quote unquote wrong, according to the religion, right. but as, as, that as, I'm causing that person to do right, something wrong. Slow. As the Baal Shem Tov yeah. said, as the Baal Shem Tov said, right? I believe it's what the Baal Shem Tov said. In the beginning, I thought I'm going to be above the whole world. And then my, my, city, my country, my city, my shul, myself. You're not in charge of everyone else's Judaism. Right. And you can't put it on them. Well, if you, if, if you, if I'm coming to you now, okay. That is a I'm Jewish saying, belief though. Right. But no, you can't force it on anyone. And I agree you know, with you. The Belzer said once, old Belzer yeah. said once, that the only time you should wake up another Jew is to give him food to eat. Not to dove him, not to learn, not to nothing. No, I agree, but that's different than. You can't, so you can't force it on them. I agree. No, I agree for but if you're enabling and then you may be getting the... What do you mean enabling? Meaning maybe you're responsible for this you're, or allowing how, the bus. Right, there is... The, I'll tell you. You're not a bus driver. You're not a bus company. No, but I am the person allowing the bus driver to drive. In other words, there is such an idea... But it's not of, your responsibility. But unfortunately, whether well, I agree, or not... But I agree, I agree with you on a, on, a, on a theoretical space. But the reality is, is that within Judaism, there is an element of... We're all right. responsible for each other, which again, obviously you have put through with your army service. You're responsible for all Jews, something or no, whatever. Lamaisa, we're one part. Like we, right. in reality, we're one people. But more than that, there's also a concept of don't put a stone in front of a blind person. That okay. therefore I am responsible. If I give you a McDonald's, right? That right. I am partake in that sin. And therefore, even though I agree with you, it's a secular society. Who am I to shove my but values you're, in someone you're else? You're not giving it to me. You're not the one giving it to me. Me. They put their politicians in, right? They vote for a certain person. Who's they? The, the guys of Tel Aviv. Right. The guys of the kibbutzim. Right. They were not religious for 100 years. Right, no, I hear what you're saying. Like, like how you can't to enforce anything on them. And obviously it's not right. going to work. Why would they like you? No, no, I agree with you like, on, like, like, on a theoretical. Have, like, I'm just playing devil's and, and advocate on the, the other side. Right, and that's one of the reasons I'm saying every day, thank you, Hashem, that I'm not a politician. <laughs> <laughs> that's not my responsibility. Right. No, you're right. But if I saying, choose, yeah. to, I, I, I'm not responsible for you. But it comes, if, if I see a kid smoking on Shabbos in the five towns, do I have any right to go I take away saying, the cigarette out of his hand? No, for he's sure. Saying, he's saying Tel Aviv and Yerushalayim are two different countries. Yeah, it, it, I'm not saying a different. Just because doesn't mean but they, right need, to but they do that. have one federal law. It's the same of like, like uh, conservatives and liberals. We live in the same country. It's a democracy at the end of the day. And therefore, so really for the, the people, becomes. it also becomes, we're not only talking about politicians, we're talking about rabbis. The answer really is that it's not a religious state. I agree with you, but that's the identity crisis. And therefore, Jewish people will say that, okay, if I'm in government, if the same way when you have a Rav, that rabbi, Expect, uh, he accepts the responsibility of his congregation. Right. And therefore he makes decisions for them. Is that going to please everyone? No, but right. he feels that responsibility. So the rabbis on the right of, on the political spectrum in Israel feel that responsibility. They're saying at the end of the day, if I vote to allow legislation, let, let's say, well, not a bus, let's say a restaurant, right. not having to keep basic kosher. And let, okay, let's be real, Rabbi Not is not the most kosher thing in the world. Why not? So I've heard. No. Okay. Rabbi Note. 
Rabbanut Tel Aviv. So Rabbanim will stand behind it, right? Okay. okay. And I, we also had in my yeshiva, Rabbanim from Rabbanut come to our yeshiva. I'm just saying, again, I don't care what you guys yeah, eat. I don't know anyone that uh, came whatever. I mean, I know people. Pe they, the rabbis of Rabbanut came to our yeshiva and told us, you guys should not eat this. I so asked, they should not be rabbis of the Rabbanut. How can you be safe for another Jew? You eat it. And I'm not. Because and I'm- especially guy, especially guys who were not raised religious. Like if a guy, right? A no, guy wakes up in Tel Aviv and says, I want to start keeping kosher, right? Mm -hmm. And he eats, and for him, kosher is the Rabbanot, right? That's he wonderful. Sees, oh. He sees the Rabbanot. Hold you on, hold on, hold on. This no is not, this is not a double wonderful. standard. What it is, is that we have this basic minimal standard that, that at the minimum, at least you're not breaking, let's say, most of the laws. Then certain people accept on themselves more stringent things. So this Rabbanot rabbi- But if I trust you, if I trust you, if I see a Haredi guy, right? Giving the Hashgokha on, on this particular thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know any better. I trust you. In Israel, people don't. But people do. The Hold average on, the person, someone... the average person who starts to keep kosher, right? Mm -hmm. And they never had a rabbi. They don't yeah. know the difference between the rabbi not or not. They they then they're doing so, something fantastic by keeping so, rabbi not. That no, doesn't mean the rabbi not rabbi, rabbi who yeah. knows better. Well, if you know better, don't no, give you a hechsher. Hold on a second. One, one thing okay. at a time. Okay. I'm yeah, all yeah. over the place over here. Right. Okay. It's so very, good. No, it's good. No, it's all good. It's very, very simple. I would definitely agree that if there's a rav who's a rav of a rabbinut, but at the same time believes you shouldn't be eating it, How you should not be yeah. a rabbinut of the rabbinut. With that being said, no one is also saying that someone who doesn't keep kosher and starts keeping rabbinut, that that's not a great thing. It is. Additionally, at the same time, for someone who's a little more advanced and is aware more of the practical halachic issues and the details of, let's say, following Mishnah Baruch Shulchan Aruch, based halacha, you can also understand that eating rabbinut is not something that the traditional, let's just say, person in, you know, Rav, let's just say in this community, would say that someone should do. Right. All those things are true all at the same time. They're not. What part is I'm not true? I'm going to go into your field, okay? Please. Okay. Maybe, maybe it's not I'm the best you example. My field. No, you're, I want to keep you're, it you're, in you're, example. You don't stand in excitement. If you, you do real estate, right? Yeah, but you're if you see a house is a bad deal, be. you're not. If you see a house is a very bad deal, and you tell your brother, "Hey, don't buy this as an investment property," and a guy comes to you, "I want to buy an investment property," and you sell him this deal, and you know in your heart that he's going to lose all his money, and you still do it because you make a percentage out of this deal, right? You're problematic. Now the same thing on this rabbi. If you know that this is not kosher. No and one you said believe, it's not kosher. Or you well, believe not. it's not okay. good enough for your brother to eat. Don't put your stamp on it. I'm not putting my name. No one said that. I'm so confused. Yeah, what that's said. what he said. He said that the rabbi from the rabbinot said that it's not kosher enough. Again, I, I think we have to like reestablish a little bit. What is a heksha? Hold on, pause. Okay. I just yeah. agreed though. Okay. That the rabbi from the rabbinot who gives a psak, the rabbinot is good, is full of shit if he goes and says, tells the next person they shouldn't be eating there. Exactly. And they shouldn't be, but I right. just, I, I oh, agree okay. with that you. Okay, but why can't people? But yeah, but I said at the same time that that could still very well mean that I believe is, let's just say, a from Jew, right? Or or someone that is, let's just say, in the Haredi world, that the Rabbanon is still not a hechsher that the standard person that's, let's just say, following Mishnah Barua Shulchan Aruch should be eating on a daily basis. That, that could be a thing. I think, just, okay. I'm just saying, those two right. things are separate. And I, I I think what he was saying originally was just that if you go to, let's just say, the average Rav in this community, right, mm -hmm. who's running your typical shul, or you go to probably Satmer, or anywhere, they're right. going to say, don't eat Rabbanu. They'll say, do you Rabbanu Maja? Very possible. Most of them, I think very that's possible, all he was saying. Yeah. Right? Is that accurate? Yeah, I'm that's saying that, was, in other words, okay. I'm, all I'm saying, because I don't want it to be misrepresented. I have never settled a debate in my entire life. <laughs> You're in the middle ground. <laughs> and I just did. <laughs> So. I just because I also don't want to misrepresent what the rabbinu position of those rabbis is, and I, but I also will defend that position. I think it's the right thing, and um, that they're basically saying if you if I'm speaking to a crowd of people that I know that their standards are higher, that they hold themselves to a more chumradic, to a more stringent standards, then I will um, advise them in accordance to their standards. That's right. not to say rabbinu is not kosher, right? I will tell you, I have eaten rabbinu and I would do so again because it has a basic, was, what is the idea of a heksha? Because it's something I asked my cousin, he's like, uh, Rob, know you. Mm -hmm. um, he, he said, listen, at the end of the day, I said, can I, I asked him straight up. I was like, this is what I've heard coming to, to Israel. Can I eat rabbinu? He said, listen, at the end of the day, a heksha is, the whole point is that you put it on the rabbi's shoulders. Mm -hmm. The second it has that, that signature, right. you can eat it. He said to me, listen, if you're asking me the question, then maybe you're now holding on a different level of religiosity that right. maybe you would choose not to. Like basically, if I knew all the itty bitty details, maybe I wouldn't eat it. That is not to say that the rubber nut is not kosher. It is. The second that something has a heksha, we rely on that rabbi's shoulders. I don't burn in hell. That's what a heksha that's is. Right. And that's, that's how it should be. But that doesn't mean that the rabbi who gives 
the Heksha, especially something where in like Rabbanu in Israel, where it's a lot to do with practicality, right? That I don't think it's so insane that he for himself is more Chumradik. It might not be the best way to do it because things will fall lax. So I believe if you put your, like, if you put your stamp on something mm -hmm. and stamp you don't trust that, you should not put a stamp anywhere. So for example, if I go into Gaza with my guys, right? And I don't trust one of them and I still take him into Gaza and something happens to him. It's on me 100%, right? Why? Although this guy was begging me to go in. But you if I decision. don't trust him 100% and I say this guy should go in and something happens to him, it's on me, right? Same thing with a hechsher. If you give your hechsher on something and you don't trust it, you should not give I'm a with you on that. That, that, that. I also agree with that element just because it's so funny because I had the, oh, this argument with my father who's in Kashrus and I was on the other side. I was like, if the, the Dayan who puts his name on this, like would see certain elements, like I don't believe he would eat this, and like and then but I but on a countrywide level, I do hear the practicality oh, element. So that's all I'm going to say is that like and it, but again it goes back. Should there be those practicalities? Is what your I think mm -hmm. original stance was right. was like should these practicalities be in place? Again, I'm, I, what I'm saying if we go back to where we started this argument, I'm saying you can't force anyone right. anything. I agree. Uh, you just can't. It's, it's, and, and if you look at everything in this world, once you force people, I think people, the entire answer is yes, just it's not successful. It's just I hard. It's Orthodox Judaism. I think right, the entire answer is: is it secular state or is it or is it a religious right? state? Oh, that's the that, whole entire thing. And the answer is: it's a secular state. It should be. We don't even yeah. like the, again until Zionism and the state of Israel was here. From people didn't even believe in the concept of it. No. So how did it now become a religious state? It's mm -hmm. not. It's a secular state, and now religious people live there and take advantage of it. That's what how at least us in the Lipish world see it. Once it's there, we're not not going to support it. We're not not going to go. But the point is, is that it's not a religious concept. We don't believe. Let's just say for Mashiach is here. It's a secular. I state. believe Mashiach will come, and then. But it's I'm just giving change. an example. Up till then, it's a secular state. That's our own belief. So right. How can we go and 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 hold back all, everyone else that's living there when we ourselves are be I, in my opinion from what everything I know that would be a direct contradiction. So let me ask you this. Obviously. You weren't fond of Bibi with regards to other things, but I am curious to hear your take on his judicial reform, if that you thought was smart or a big mistake. Like, just a bad... Was he right about that? Let's ask it that way. So, the court system needs to get fixed. Overall, the court system has to get fixed. So you are in agreement to agree. Um, I am in an agreement. The Supreme Court is open. Yes, about. in Israel. Have to, like, they did a lot of things that they shouldn't have done. For example... If a terrorist kills a Jew, he should not get out after 12 years. And they gave rulings like that. <laughs> or if someone unfortunately raped Jewish girls and they say the case is not because of racial hate. And the guy said in his interrogations that he did do just because she's Jewish. And they give him a sentence as something else. That is a problem. And they did that. Time out. If you are a terrorist, you get out after 12 years? Sometimes. In some cases, yeah. Why? I don't understand that. Or if someone was caught with a knife and he said that he wants to go stab Jews and he got out after a year and a half because he didn't do anything yet. What do you think is going to happen to that guy? You don't right. think he's going to try again? And some of them did try again. And after prison, he's going to be even worse. Exactly. So they definitely need a change. For sure. So the way to do your change, if the way BB did it or not, I can't tell you. So part well, of the, the problem So part of the problem was a lot of people in Israel became against BB. A lot. So sometimes as a leader you have to understand that if anything you do, people are gonna be against. Maybe it's time for you to step down. Got it. Maybe not. I don't know. So that actually brings me to a question I had before and what you said about BB. Is like, do you because you said you think he has for the state of Israel? Do you think any of it is more like, I want to say like Trumpy a little bit that like for his own ego? Or you think Mamish like really, really down brass tacks, he genuinely, genuinely, all he cares about is the state of Israel. Like he is a diehard zealot. Or is there a little bit of his own, or is it a middle ground? I'm going to stop you by a question. Do you think Trump wants to be the president of the United States just because he has a big ego and he wants to have a check on being the president? Or Definitely do you part of it. I think a big part of it is that he feels when he goes to sleep at night, he feels that he could do a very good job. Oh, I agree. And, like, and that's his ego. He's saying, right. I'm the best, I'm the baller, I'm the boss. And I'm sure Label has uh, very right. publicized that. Uh, right. But he actually he actually job. believes in that. <laughs> he actually believes in that. Yeah. Now, BB, the same thing. BB, when he goes to sleep, he actually believes that he is the best. 
because I don't think he's a human being that would have not done it if he would have believed that he's not the best. Which means everyone has their belief, right? I believe I'm the best driver. If I'll let my wife drive, maybe she's better than me. I don't know. But I believe I'm the best car driver. I've never crashed in anything. I'm, I'm a good driver, right? I think I'm the best at it. Maybe someone is better, maybe. But he thinks that he is the best as prime minister. And that's why he is running. I, don't, I think he has in his mind the favor of Israel. I don't think he does it for his own ego. But I think his own ego got involved with certain cases that his right. vision might have been a little Excuse not so sense. clear. Let me ask you this. This is a boring, uh, important thing. I'm going to go slightly backwards. I, I, I meant to ask you this. With regards to the hostages... Right. Specifically. Do you, as far as the concept of exchanging prisoners, murderers specifically, and there's prisoners, they're not doing tax fraud here. I don't, yeah, prisoners um, is not. Yeah. Regarding releasing murderers for hostages, is that something that you think, it's almost like I feel like we didn't learn our lesson because the person that literally made this entire thing happen, Senoir, was released for Prince Shalit, yet we're, we just made an offer of 800, like a lot of them murderers, terrorists, in exchange for 40 hostages. Right. What is your, your feelings on that? So on one hand, we have to get our hostages back. They didn't do anything. They're not. We have to get them back. I, everyone's now, that. however, we're going to do it. I don't know. I don't feel comfortable 800 hostage, hostage, 800 terrorists for 40 hostages. I think that's. That's how it should happen. I think Israel should say in first place, this is just not happening. Like, like you tell someone, hey man, this is just not gonna happen. If you want, maybe one on one, I'll be okay with. I don't know. Right. But I don't think eight hundred. Is... Go ahead on that. That is a problem because the cat's out of the bag. Again, I don't. I don't think. Why would BB do that? I don't freaking understand. That. I, I, I can't. I can't answer. I well, I understand the pain of the hostage families, and maybe. I would have thought something else if my brother would have been a hostage. I hope not. I really hope not. When I go to sleep at night and that's what I think that it should be one-on-one, -on -one, I would say the same thing. If it's literally myself or someone else that like being hostage, I would also expect it to be just one-on-one -on -one and not 40 for one or 100 for one. I don't think that makes any sense. Um, I think that whole governmental thing has to change, which means you tell them, this is just not gonna happen. Like you can tell, like if someone comes to me, like, "Hey, I want something. Like, I want your house. Get out of your house. Am I gonna give it to him?" So I'm just trying to understand why they would do that. They're not idiot. Like there's like Benny Gantz, all these guys, BB, they're hardliners. Like they know what. Like why do they keep on falling for this trap? I think a lot of people still still stuck at what the world is gonna say and what other people thinking about the world and right. whatever. And, and I don't think that because I think it has proven itself that they're against us. Yeah. No one is there for you. You got to be there for yourself. And if you're not going to fight for yourself, no one is going to help you. Let me, let me ask you this. One other thing. Um, I saw that one of the soldiers who unfortunately passed away wrote, you know, in his, in his letter before, you know, he went to war that if he gets captured, he does not want any asked, any swaps of prisoners for him do you feel the same way about yourself you would handle it the same way or do most soldiers feel that as well if i come back and i know that the guy who got released because of me killed 1500 jews and made a bloody war and the whole mess that's going on i would not have a good life and in a way i would rather stay there than having to face the reality and knowing that this whole mess is happening because What about if me. it wasn't Sinoir? You don't have crystal balls, so you don't know what's going to happen down the road. So I, again, so that's in for those reasons, I would not want this to happen to me. I would rather suffer another half a year, a year, or whatever it's going to take for Israel to win because I believe eventually Israel is going to stop looking at whatever the world says and just do whatever they got to do. Do you think that's true even with the... America now seemingly semi-bailing on them? I hope so. I hope it's time for them to care for themselves. It's you, have to, you have to stand up and do what's right for your people. And if you don't care for your... If, you're, if you don't see first and front most your people, your hostages, it's a problem. Like, you got to see your people. What they, like, they're yours. Like, Israeli citizens are not Americans. Right. And, and 
and look at look at this even there is American hostages in Gaza now did the American government get them out no they didn't right why it's crazy this makes no sense right so yeah. you gotta care for your people and America should care for their people and and you can't wait for someone else like it's no so, one else is gonna clean after you it's so interesting that you think that's the reason because it's to me at least like I see it as like the cats out of the bag that they realize that Jews care so much Israelis okay, not Jews Israelis care so much about their own people that they're willing to give a lot, like the thousand to one killer shallot, that they see that element and they're like, Jews love life. That's just the reality. Right. And therefore we can get, and it's like from a negotiating position, Israel's in a weak position. We are in a weak position. In, in, in this particular instance, weak, I mean by 40 to one. Um, and we should fight that back and we should not agree on that. And I think the tone should be, this is just not happening. Yeah. Like, it's well, just not going to happen. You don't think it's too Ev late? Huh? You don't think it's too late? It could still change. Well, they ha they've said they that. They should change their policy. Should whoever the prime minister of Israel is going to be next, or still be me now, should stand up one day and say, hey, Hamas or Jihad Islami or whoever is trying to make a deal, we are just not going to make a deal like that. Just not going to happen. Now, let's figure out what is going to happen. This well, is he, not happening. He's done that with other deals, definitely. They want the withdrawal, obviously, and, and he's been like, your demands and are delusional. This should be the same song on that. But, and uh, then, because eventually Hamas is going to have to break. We're, gonna, we're going into Rafa Mitz Hashem as well, I hope so at least, and we're going to break them. We're, we're going to bring down their buildings. We're going to fight until we get our hostages back. And eventually we're going to corner them. So they're going to have to raise their hands one day. Right. They're going to have to. We should be strong and like, you know, sometimes in a boxing match, you can see that when does someone win? When the second you see the other guy starts breathing heavy right. and feeling that's when you're going for the knockout punch. If you're going to go in for a knockout punch before the guy's tired, right. you're going to get now. hit. We should be stronger and not breathe heavy. We should push them and push them and push them until we're going to win with a knockout. And, and it's going to happen. Do you see that happening? I hope it's going to happen. I believe it's going to happen. It's a matter of time. Right. The person who has the stones for that is Netanyahu. I can't right? think anyone. I can't think of any other politician having the stones to say, "I will die on this hill. This is my political career, and this is what." Exactly. And you messed it up. You should fight all the way till the end, and and whatever it takes, get them back. But don't right. lower down your standards for that. Were you against the Shalit uh, deal back in back then? Well, I was very young back then, so I, can't. So you couldn't give <laughs> I, I wasn't. I wasn't involved. If I look back at it. I don't know. This okay. guy has a good life now, so I, I can't right. say anything. But Let's go a little more current. Could you talk quickly about what it's been like for yourself and other soldiers transitioning from army life, the difficulty there from army life, let's say, to the regular world? It's very hard um, because you never know when you're going to get called back again. You have no idea when you're they're going to call you back. You're still active reserve. Like In a way, yeah. Um, I hope not to get called back again, but if I will, it's going to be a very hard call for me if I go or not. Um, it's very hard to continue life knowing that the hostages are not back yet. Like, I'm going to sleep at night not comfortable. Like, I feel I didn't finish my job. I feel my friends, they didn't die for nothing, but they didn't die for a good enough reason. I was hoping uh, this far in, we should have the hostages back and things should get calmer. So for a lot of soldiers, other than the things they've seen and they live with is very hard, it's even more hard to get back to life knowing your job is not done. Job is like, like you risked your life. You fought for something and it's not done yet. And that is makes it a little difficult um, to continue your life. A lot of guys lost their job. I'm talking a lot of guys lost their job and they have to, you know, get help finding new jobs wow. and, and continuing in life. Um, and I'm praying and hoping that life will be able to continue. And that's why I think we need to win and we're going to win. And that's when people will be able to continue with their life as they should. You know, what was the out. reception like for you coming back within New Square and Satmar and given that whole situation? Positive overall? Uh, yeah, I, I, I looked at it very positive. I think even people who disagree with a lot of things, the state of Israel or disagree with a lot of things, um, the IDF does. In the end, they understand that it had to happen. It's not like... We decided we're going to take over the country and we're going to go in. They killed us. They raped us. Like, we, we had to stand up. It's not right. like we had a choice. And I see people really understand that. 
and 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 even if people don't sometimes i think it just passes me i don't even see it like i i i know right. i did what's right and i know i did what's important to do at the time the achdus mm. especially in chutzla arets do you feel that that's long lasting or is that like a temporary thing and i was like we're seeing that a lot it's a big move like i see visionets hasidim Garrett coming in they're doing they make they're doing their part within the realm of their belief system do you think that's something that this could have a lasting impact on I like after so. after Sisro? I definitely hope it's gonna have it's gonna last for a long time, and I'm praying it should, and I wish it will. Like I think we're doing good, and we should continue to do good stuff. Um, everyone, everywhere, whichever way they can. For example, there was like hundreds, hundreds probably of Atzala paramedics who went to Israel to help to volunteer. There was millions of dollars being sent. That it's very important. There's lots of praying and challah giving and, and all this, and I really hope it will stay. I believe. Hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of Jews who did not keep Shabbos before the war. Now, if it's because a, because a soldier or if it just made them more Jewish are starting to keep Shabbat, which is something you see clearly. And, and I hope it continues that way. In England, that was actually huge. Oh, sorry. No, it's fine. It's yeah, no, just that element of like people like showing their Jewish identity and feeling it for the first time in their lives. They have yeah. had nothing to do with it. Someone says, oh, you shouldn't wear a Mark and David. They're going to wear a fucking Mark and David. Right. Yeah, there was a huge, huge, the response was wild. I mean, I was right. in Israel October 7th. It was, oh. and then I came back here. It was unbelievable. There seemed to be a point when you left, let's say when you're 19, at least looking at things, mm -hmm. where you were, became a little less religious, right. left the fold. Now you seem right. to be more in the fold. What, is that, ac is that accurate, first of all? And if so, how did that, how did getting back into the fold happen? It just happened over time. Um, and I believe sometimes you got to go a, a little bit somewhere else and see that there is problems everywhere. Like I've, I've seen communities a lot more messed up than anything I've seen around here. Really? Which ones? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not going to name, but like I had soldiers who came from really really broken homes like i'm talking neck like in my wildest dreams i didn't think that normal people really ever had a, a life like that and just seeing the outside world and, and understanding that life is not as bad as i thought as by 19 years old it is and, and it's actually good and i just got a lot more connected and i appreciate it and i kind of like being from really yes yeah. very interesting by leaving you gained the appreciation yes of like the lifestyle yes like it's like people say with Shabbos, that was something that actually helped me personally a lot of like, if you see Shabbos as a restraint, it'll be impossible to keep. Yeah. If you see it as freeing, you have a break. God gave you this like day to yeah. just be yourself with family. I think Shabbos is one of the most beautiful days. It, like it's family time. Like there's no Wi-Fi in Shabbos. Like there's no, like you live with your family. You, you have a family meal. You appreciate, you get time to think. Like, I, I think it's a beautiful thing. Like I, I really think it's beautiful. I'm sure people have like wronged you. For sure, ten years ago, whatever, twelve years ago, and people apologize. Meaning, I don't think I, I don't I don't see that I don't see it in any way that they wrong me. You don't even say it, okay? No, like no. they they didn't understand, and I'm not their teacher. And and if they have an opinion that I don't have, that is very okay with me. Got it. So right, that's incredible. First of all, I I guess I was more referring. Did anyone ever do anything like directly to you as opposed to just having an opinion and you know that type of thing? It doesn't really matter because if they did, in their best belief, they thought they're doing the right thing. It's yeah. like if someone did something to me, right? I don't think they did it because they hate Chaim Isles. They just didn't understand the things I'm doing and the reason I'm doing it. And the reason they didn't understand it is not because they, whatever, they just don't have the brain to think the way I think or, or, or whatever oh, the reason is. And impressive. I don't think they hurt me in any personal way. You also mentioned that, again, you got married a year ago. Yeah, and about. you were about to come on here, and you were debating, and you're like, "Yeah, label, I love you." You didn't say that exactly. But you're like, <laughs> "I thought this one over for a few nights." You're a good salesman, but um, my marriage is more important. Which respect? It is. <laughs> just, it just it really is. And, no. and hopefully, very soon you'll understand that. Uh, yes. If you want. Oh, very soon. No, I mentioned yes. I very <laughs> if much. If you want. want, no, I do. Like a minefield. <laughs> yeah, if you, no, say, no. Like, if you like, if you want, I really wish you should find your right one and you no, understand. I do. I do. That, that is very important. I absolutely want. Um, so, like, how has your life changed given that? You're living where? You said New Square. I No, I, I was young to the New Square. I live in uh, Pomona. Oh, you live in Pomona? I live in Pomona. Pomona. Pomona's a yeah. chill place. Everyone it is. It's a nice, it's a very place, nice yeah, area. Nice community. The Deepa lives there, no? 
have no idea. I think I went to Pomona one travel and I saw Lipa. So. I have, I, like, I, I'm, 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 I'm like, I've been there for a couple of months and half of it I was in Gaza. So I'm, I'm <laughs> although I've been there for a while on the books, I haven't been there as much and a lot of Shabbos might go away. I don't say It's funny, I, I feel like you have so <laughs> much experience and like, I feel like I'm genuinely talking to a guy that's like 37, 38, like based on this conversation. It's very, Thank very you. impressive, truly. And like, you're my age and I'm like, oh shit, I gotta catch, <laughs> I gotta catch up, man. I'm a, I'm a I feel like that meeting you. <laughs> I'm a child, man. Like, what is going on here? I gotta get my uh, act together over here. I wanna say thank you so much. I'm not kidding. I, I, I know that there are so many people who are gonna watch this who are gonna be so gained, first of all, so much and get such an informative view. First of all, in the war and get some understanding of what you experienced. That's just done a very practical sense of that. But also, I think such a incredible, incredible thing, if I'm being truly honest, is your experience. You're still young, you're my age, and yet you operate in such a calm, middle of the road, no anger, like you said, no rebellion, as you said, kind of manner. I think that is such a impressive thing. There are so many reasons Thank to you. be angry, I'm sure. Um, and I feel like there are so many people that would have come out of your experience and been fuming and just frustrated and all that and yet you you're not i don't know how but you're you seem like you you know are ready to forgive have forgiven forget about ready have and that's a truly special thing and i think that's the most important lesson by the way of this entire thing forget about the war forget about all these things if there's one lesson that i'm taking from this truly it's like the way to move forward is to forgive seems like you did that i don't know if i'm right yeah i i that's yeah. the energy that i i, I, I I believe you should forgive and I believe that anyone who did any like if someone does something against you or, or tries to hurt you it's it's it sounds like a his problem yeah it's like if if I know at night that I did my best every day like what are they gonna do like I agree. you don't agree it's, it's kind of your loss <laughs> yeah like, that's the way to sleep all night you're doing your best I have to say it's like crazy refreshing like, I don't think there are many people who would come out from the experience that you went through with your perspective. I think it's very rare. And I hope a lot more will. Please God. No, yeah. the, 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 the modus operandi is that I feel like a lot of people who come out from the Heimish, the, you know, the ultra-Orthodox community are coming out and saying, um, and like, have a problem with it. They want to change it. You're coming out and you had an appreciation for it and you've come out with this very nuanced, like, honestly, lovely view. Like, it was honestly fantastic hearing Can say it. again, the people that come out against is the people you see. I think there's thousands of people like me who just are not looking for the spotlight and they just want to continue their life and that's why you don't see them. If there's hundreds of cars, right, passing this road, you're not going to talk about it. If there's one car is going to crash, yeah. everyone is going to talk about it. I think there's thousands of people who have a good life. Yeah. Chaim, thank you so, so much for coming on. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I love this conversation. Guys, thank you so much for watching. We'll be back next week for a fantastic episode. Peace and love.